I was just thinking today that if I were ever to have a good lunch somewhere, I would want to have lunch in Albuquerque. Albuquerque sounds like a lovely place to drive and have lunch. And then after, after I finish my lunch, just drive off into the desert. And I'm thinking about doing that one of these times. I'm going to just drive to Albuquerque and have lunch and then leave. All right. This is called The Sinking of the RMS Titanic Was a Hoax. This is something I originally wrote two years ago. And I dusted it off the shelf to present this. And as I dusted it off the shelf, I found that the original was unpresentable. It was pretty bad. I know maybe my standards have changed. I don't know. But I basically wrote this entire thing from scratch this week. Now, it's sitting at 70 pages, give or take. And I was writing it up to this afternoon. And then finally, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. But if I were given another week or two, and I just kept digging into this, I would imagine that it would be, go from 70 pages to 140, to 300, to 600, and just keep building. Because this narrative is so titanic, it's ginormous, and it's ridiculous. Once you see how they, you know, the slide of hand, how they pull the bunny out of the hat, you just start looking at this, and it just starts falling apart. And you're like, this whole thing is so ridiculous. How could I never see this before? So hopefully, before this is over, you too will be able to um, look at this and, and see that it's a movie. That's what it is. So let's get started. As you can see here on the second page, I'm, I'm starting to put my publication dates on this just for, for record keeping. I first published this uh, between May 10th and 13th, over three articles. That's why it's given those dates in 2020. And the second edition is today, December 23rd, 2021. Part one, 1985 slash 1997. Now, I'm going to give this story. Um, I, I told myself about an hour ago I wouldn't, but now I'm already saying that I'm going to break my own, um, my own promise. <laughs> so I'm going to just do it. For those of you who were listening last Sabbath, uh, late into the night, we weren't recording. I went through the, ha my personal story with the James Cameron Titanic movie. but. I'm going to do it again. So if you heard it, just entertain me, amuse me, and listen again. But the movie Titanic came out in 1997. It, 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 kind, of, it kind of means something to me in a very embarrassing way. It's because uh, that's the year that I met the woman that would be my wife. Now, I had just come from London. I was standing in front of Buckingham Palace when news struck that Princess Diana was killed in a Paris tunnel, which now I look back and I see that that was a hoax. But <clears throat> fly home. I started my junior year of high school. Um, my wife, Sarah, she was a sophomore. And I remember the first day that she walked into third period. The first time I ever laid eyes on her, she walked in right as the bell rung and she was wearing her cheerleader slash cadet uniform. And there was a voice in my head a very strong one that I attribute to Yah. And the voice said, be kind to her. She's of importance to her, uh, of importance to you. And I can still remember that. Be kind to her. She's of importance to you. And I was immediately struck with terror uh, at her and a, at a, a, a fear of Yah. And um, I always treated her uh, with kindness accordingly. But I wanted to date her. And I knew that she was on the squad and that you can't just go up to a cadet slash cheerleader and uh, ask them on a date. It, does, it doesn't always work that way. I was certainly not in the position for that. I was not on the football team. I was on the video production team. And I, quit, I had the wisdom to learn that if I went around to all the other cadets and cheerleaders and befriended them, if I gained their trust, then they would sign me off to go out with her, which I did. It took me about three months before I ever really approached her and talked to her. I went and got to, I found out who her friends were. I got to know them. And then as we're approaching Christmas break, and it would have been 1997, I got her, in, her phone number from one of her closest friends. So for my birthday, uh, during Christmas break, I went to see Titanic. And, you know, all that garbage that you know the mush my heart will go on and all that kind of stuff 
And I felt so inspired by the movie that I, um, I remember running home from the theater when it was done. It was late at night. It was like a three-hour movie, right? And I had her phone number on a piece of paper. This was the dial-up phones, right, with the cords. I had to go sit in my parents' room because you had the, the, the household with one phone, tell everybody to get off the phone. And it took me an entire hour to dial her number, and I kept, like, hanging it up. And then I finally um, got her and... Um, you know, asked her, I, I couldn't ask her on a date. I, I lowered the bar and I asked her to be my lab partner, uh, which she agreed, which amazingly, she was a, you know, 4.0. Uh, she was the valid Victorian full ride to college. Uh, that was the one class I ever failed in high school. I was her lab partner and I failed um, that class, but she said I was the best lab partner ever. So it obviously I had an effect on her. Anyways, let's get started on this. Part one, 1985, 1997. If I had time another week to write this. I would have made three different parts. I would have made 1985 and 1997 two different parts. But, you know, because this is, this is becoming an epic journey here. The sinking of the RMS Titanic was one of the most traumatic events that the post mud flood world had ever experienced, particularly in the years leading up to the First World War. But even long afterwards, I just realized I'm not recording on my end. That would help. And you already know the story. It involves a ship which not even God could sink, but then collided with an iceberg on its maiden voyage, resulting in a heavy yet completely unnecessary and totally avoidable loss of life. Our writers of history have hammered these plot points out repeatedly into each successive generation because it makes for the perfect psychodrama. Really, this was the intel community at their finest. The brightest and wealthiest of minds were involved. We're talking a top-notch production with a resplendent cast. They simply don't write these psyops like they used to. Every memorable performance needs a good punchline. And the 1912 Titanic movie most certainly has one. You've heard it said dozens of times before, and in fact, if you were paying attention, I've already mentioned it in the first paragraph. Not even God could sink the ship. I'll have you know that line has been attributed to multiple passengers, including everyone from Chief Designer Thomas Andrews and Captain Smith to White Star Chairman Bruce Ismay or any number of Titanic's crewmen and shipyard workers. In the Titanic movie, James Cameron has Rose's fiancé, played by Billy Zane, make the claim. Ridiculous. They probably all said it. Every last one of them. I wouldn't doubt it. After all, it was the best quip in the Intel script of 1912, and everybody wanted to be the actor remembered for it. For the following so many pages, you'll have to try your darndest to fend the indoctrination off, especially now that, you're, that you've sung the Celine Dion song in the shower. The Titanic's final passage to the ocean floor was an elaborate hoax, but you knew that already. It's in the title. And I know what you're thinking. As I write these words, there is a reported shipwreck at the bottom of the Atlantic. Its coordinates are 41.729 or 6931 degrees north and 49.948253 degrees west. Its depth, 12,500 feet. Oh, I know. They have photographs to prove it, courtesy of Hollywood, National Geographic, and the Navy. Regardless, what I am trying to tell you is that there may be plenty of shipwrecks all over the world, but the Titanic is certainly not one of them. It arrives safely at dock. This is another one of those papers that I initially covered a couple of years ago. I'm dusting it off from the shelf because I have some new information to share, but also because I'm weary of everyone coming to the unexpected cosmology and claiming that its sinking had something to do with the Rothschild's formation of the Federal Reserve or that the Titanic was swapped out for her sister ship, and that it is the Olympic sitting upon the ocean floor. Neither are correct. Those are conspiracy theories which are probably spoon-fed to us by the intel community to keep the PSYOP afloat, when in fact the entire episode was a stage performance. The year was 1985 when Titanic's wreckage was finally located by someone named Robert Ballard. That's really where our investigation into the sinking needs to begin, with its discovery. Discredit one hoax, and you will be sure to find that its sinking story is another. Try to understand what I am saying. 
There was never anything to discover at the bottom of the ocean. We shall get to know him somewhat better then. So from the wiki article here, we see Ballard grew up in Pacific Beach, San Diego, California, to a mother of German heritage and a father of British heritage. He has attributed his early interest in underwater exploration to watching the Disney adaptation of the 1970 Jules Verne novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Right away, the Wikipedia tells us that his interest in underwater exploration was due to his love of reading Jules Verne. And that's rather odd, don't you think? Why not write wiki articles on people who run home security businesses while we're at it and tell everyone they were inspired by childhood viewings of Home Alone? It probably has something more to do with the Verne connection than anything else. If Verne's stories inspired so many quote-unquote discoverers of the official narrative, and we hear this often enough, it's because they encrypted Masonic and um, Roscurian secrets and sacred symbolism into the text. Not surprising at all that the Apollo moon landing missions called for literal inspiration from Verne's From the Earth to the Moon. Some have argued that Verne's The Underground City follows the steps of initiation into Freemasonry, preparation, voyage to the beyond, and rebirth. Verne displayed knowledge of the higher Masonic raids, which are only made available to a Mason. And that is why he is so often quoted publicly. Vern is one of the ways in which spooks pass notes in class. Next, we read how Robert Ballard was commissioned directly out of ROTC into Army Intelligence. Jules Verne was above suspicion, but this latest tidbit is a deal breaker. The Titanic was discovered by the Intel Department. Sure, of course it was. Probably nothing more to see here. Even more surprising, though, is their confession to Entel's part in this little operation. While it is true that most would never think or dream the PSYOP would be pitted against them and by their own government, I'm leaning more towards the likelihood that his part in Intel slipped at some point, and they're playing it off like it's nothing. That fact is kind of just thrown in there and then never mentioned again. Upon its discovery in 1985, it wasn't just Ballard's placement in Intel that was glossed over. Even the Navy's part was greatly downplayed, making the story of Titanic's discovery an intellectually dishonest one. We would much later come to learn that the entire operation was military funded. It was nothing more than a Cold War exercise, but are you really surprised? Even here, nearly 40 years later, the Wikipedia is attempting to massage the script by claiming Ballard was only using his Navy knowledge to seek out the Titanic on his own. And as early as 1973, mind you. It says he even led his first expedition in 1977, but that much is ridiculous. Why is searching for the Titanic ridiculous, you ask? It's not. I just caught them in another lie. That's all. Wouldn't you like to know what it is? I only know about it because I've already managed to read ahead. Here, I'll show you. So this is uh, from his article on the RMS Titanic. And it says, in, in summer 1985, Ballard was aboard the French research ship Le Seroit, probably mispronounced that, which was using the side scan sonar SAR to search for the Titanic's wreckage. When the French ship was recalled, he transferred onto a ship from Woods Hole, uh, the RV Nor. Unbeknownst to some, this trip was financed by the U.S. Navy for secret reconnaissance of the wreckage of two Navy nuclear-powered attack submarines, the USS Scorpion and the USS Thresher, which sank in the 1960s and not for the Titanic. Back in 1982, he approached the Navy about his new deep-sea underwater robot craft, the Argo, and his search for the Titanic. The Navy was not interested in financing him. Her 1985 discovery was financed by the U.S. Navy for secret reconnaissance of the wreckage of two Navy nuclear-powered attack submarines, the USS Scorpion and the USS Thresher, which sank in the 1960s and not the Titanic. Also, this was unbeknownst to some, quote-unquote. Unbeknownst to some, really? More like everybody who read about it in the papers. The media conveniently overlooked the part where this was a Cold War military exercise. Placing Ballard on a French vessel and then calling it a research ship is obvious manipulation. 
Ballard would later confess the French vessel was only a disguise to fend off any suspicion from Moscow. Another lie. That's not the lie I had earlier mentioned, though. Read a little further, and in fact the very next sentence, and we are told that Ballard approached the Navy about combing the ocean floor for the Titanic in 1982, but the Navy wasn't interested. See what I mean? Didn't the Wikipedia just tell us he searched for the Titanic in 1977, but that the first expedition was un unsuccessful? The official narrative must be bipolar. Obviously, his search in 1977 can't very well be true, because the Navy did not have, have him looking for the Titanic yet. Furthermore, the Navy wasn't even interested in financing such a trip, but even that is stacked with more than one lie. All we're being fed here are lies. And then we, we see a little snippet here about Argo, the uh, underwater uh, man-free craft submarine. And it says, Argo is an unmanned, deep-toed, undersea video camera sled developed by Dr. Robert Ballard through Woods Hole Oce uh, Oceanographic Institute's Deep Submergence Laboratory. That's so wordy. Argo is most famous for its role in the discovery of the wreck of the RMS Titanic in 1985. All right. The unmanned vessel which ultimately discovered Titanic was a little guy named Argo. Fun fact. Argo was the ship which Jason sailed upon in search of the Golden Fleece. But that's probably not a metaphor for anything. Argo, of course, has its very own article. And there we are told it was developed by Robert Ballard through Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute's Deep Submergence Laboratory. I can't believe I made myself read that twice. In turn... <laughs> Here I go, third time. Whole Oceanographic Institute has its very own wiki article. I checked. Very first sentence, we read the following. Woods Hole, oh, the fourth time. <laughs> Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is a private nonprofit research and higher education facility dedicated to the study of marine science and engineering. They just keep trying to convince us that Intel has nothing to do with this little side hobby of Ballard's, don't they? Let me see if I understand this right. Ballard developed Argo at a private nonprofit research facility, which was in no way a dummy front for Intel, but then had to ask permission from the Navy to use it over the weekend. Did I get that right? We, um, are we say. I don't know if I need to read this, but you can see under the, the, the underlying part there, he already knew that the Titanic imploded ooh, from pressure as well, much the same way the two submarines did. You see, there it is. The, well, actually, let me read this whole thing. After the missions for the Navy, uh, Nor arrived on site on August 22, 1985 and deployed Argo. When they searched for the two submarines, Ballard and his team discovered that they had imploded from the immense pressure at depth. It littered thousands of pieces of debris all over the ocean floor. Following the large trail of debris led them directly to both and made it significantly easier for them to locate them than if they were to search for the holes directly. He already knew that the Titanic imploded from pressure as well, much the same way the two submarines did, and concluded that it too must have also left a scattered debris field. Using that lesson, they had Argo sweep back and forth across the ocean floor looking for the Titanic's debris trail. They took shifts monitoring the video feed from Argo, blah, blah, blah. You see, there it is. Ballard was allowed to use the Navy's multi-million dollar equipment for seeking out the Titanic wreckage, but only after he had completed his chores in international espionage. That's what they're having us go with, and I wasn't making it up. But then we read this dribble. He already knew that the Titanic imploded from pressure as well, much the same way the two submarines did, and concluded that it too must have also left a scattered uh, debris trail. What do you mean he already knew that the, that the Titanic imploded from pressure as well? How would he possibly know that? It says, using that lesson, he was capable of discovering the wreckage. How is that knowledge in any way necessary? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Now we know why the Navy had Ballard studying shipwrecks. Like the moon landing, it was never a race against the Ruskies to plant their flag upon something. Intel was simply hoping to pull off another hoax akin to it. Understand what insight is being passed along to us here. 
The Titanic was constructed of thousands of one-inch thick, mild steel plates and two million steel and wrought iron rivets. She was sliced in two and not by the iceberg. It is Ballard who figured out that out, even before his discovery, and when no other Titanic researcher could. There is not one single witness who made mention of that apparent fact either. It was not until a decade after Ballard's discovery that James Cameron had the fictional character Rose recounting the Titanic being sliced down the middle. Nobody else, though. It's been 84 years. Still more believable than the 9-11 narrative, but ridiculous all the same. Raise the Titanic was a 1980 film that had, wait for it, the RMS Titanic being raised from the Atlantic and towed safely to New York Harbor, thereby completing its maiden voyage. They were apparently able to accomplish this wondrous feat of engineering by repairing the punctured holes in its hull and then pumping the ship full of compressed air. In little time, Titanic rocketed to the surface like a submarine. My point being that everybody assumed the Titanic was still in one piece as late as 1980, just like any other shipwreck. Also, the plot centers around U.S. intelligence in a race against the Ruskies to recover weaponized m- minerals from the sunken vessel. Why does that sound? Fa- Why does that sound familiar? I'm tempted to think the same person is sitting behind the typewriter, typewriter fleshing these drafts out. I think I need a little bit more coffee. Give me a second here. That same year, a Titanic salvaging expedition was planned by Texan oilman Jack Grimm. So the context here is 1980. By this time, he had already failed to locate Noah's Ark, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, and the giant hole in the North Pole leading to Hollow Earth. Why not give Titanic the old college try? To raise funds, the wiki has him obtaining sponsorship among his poker friends. Seems legit. He then teamed up with the William Morris Agency, as if that's not suspicious, not to mention Orson Welles, one of the greatest Hollywood spooks who ever lived. Other talent include, included Kansas Senator William Ryan and scientific support from the CIA Recruiting Center, Columbia University. And if that's not enough to flag him as an official discreditor, we then re- read that Grimm employed a monkey called Titan as his consultant. No joke. The monkey was trained to point at a spot on the map to indicate where the Titanic lay in ruin. I wish I was making that up. Grimm's expedition resulted in two consecutive movies, Search for the Titanic and Return to the Titanic, both released in 1981. Clearly, Intel was gearing up for the main attraction. The only legitimate thing about Grimm's movies is Telly Savalas' part in televised hosting duties. Because Telly, uh, Telly Savalas was the Morgan Freeman of his day and totally awesome. And there's nothing neither you nor I can do to change that. Meanwhile, Raise the Titanic was a box office bomb, raking in $7 million against an estimated $40 million budget. Bummer. The movie was programming to begin with, obviously, but all the same... Intel needed to make its investment back. Producer Lou Grade later remarked, it would have been cheaper to lower the Atlantic. Still too expensive of an option. Best to drop a model of the Titanic in a pond, but with an added plot twist. Saw it in half and then erect museums in several cities so that people can pay to look at dinner plates on their family vacation. That a boy, make indoctrination profitable again. That's... Exactly what I'm suggesting, by the way. Ballard and company dropped a model into a lake. Does that really defy logic, though? The moon landing was filmed on location at the bomb craters in Arizona, but also from a stage at Lookout Mountain for composite imaging. It's not like spacewalks aren't filmed in the pool they got down there in NASA, either. The bubbles in space give that away. And just so we're clear, I'm not saying NASA is responsible this time around, as the cleaning bill for the pool would have been a Leviathan in the bank. No, they simply dropped a model on a lake. Does that look like a depth of 12,500 feet to you? At 12,500 feet, the ocean would be blacker than pitch. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. The dysphotic zone ends at 1,000 meters. 
anything deeper is known as the um, aphotic zone. The aphotic zone, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, is bathed in darkness with no light whatsoever to penetrate. Nothing. That's why the dysphotic zone is also known as the twilight zone. 1,000 meters is the equivalent of 3,280 feet, giving us a 9,220 feet surplus. Despite Argo's flashlight, there's far too much blue light in Ballard's photos, telling us that they hadn't gone deep enough to scrub the natural light from the lens. And anyways, how do you think James Cameron pulled the wreckage effect off? Oh, that's right. No special effects were used in the making of the Titanic movie. A second suggestion I'm making is that they concocted the implosion story to save on money, but also to make their model fit comfortably within the confines of the filming tank. Regardless, there's a silver lining here. Despite the Titanic being sawn asunder, I'm so glad the fine china wasn't broken in the fall, or else they wouldn't have been able to recover it for all those museums they were planning. In later dives, hoaxers decided to revisit the wreckage bathed in far too much of a blue tone, reminding us even more so that penetrating light was a factor. Kind of went a little overboard with the coloring, don't you think? Perhaps the Titanic had raised some 10,000 feet in the, in the intervening decades and resides now in the twilight zone. Who really knows? I'm not here to judge, just telling it as it is. Still no sea life, though. That's a problem, you know. There's no sea life in any of these photos. Where is the sea life? Where are the jillies and the squid, the isopods, and the anglerfish? The bioluminescence in the footage should be nothing short of awe-inspiring. And yet, we're given nada. See, this is what I absolutely can't stand about the science hoaxers. The science of his day always changes. You know, the parable of the tortoise and the hare? Slow and steady wins the race. The hoax is the hare. At the time of Ballard's discovery, it was scientifically believed that the cupboards were bare of aquatic life at 12,000 feet. And that is because, much like the shape of the Earth or the moon landing, nobody had ever dived that deep in 1985 to tell us about it. Ballard had done his due diligence on wreckage, but nothing at that depth because he imagined a cemetery when in fact we know the opposite is true today. Scientists now believe such depths rival the tropical rainforest for biodiversity. Oops. Remember how Neil Armstrong never saw stars between the Earth and the Moon? Not even on its lunar surface? This is like that. The intel community has since attempt, attempted, attempted... Okay, I think I need more coffee. Hold on here. When I, whenever I start stammering, I need to take a drink. The intel community has since attempted, there we go, to correct their oversight by adding a CG shrimp into the wreckage. You can see for yourself on the History Channel's Titanic 100 Mystery Solved documentary. The CG shrimp, it's so funny when it pops up. I had to track it down and took this picture. The CG shrimp appears at the 50, th uh, 50 minute 31 second mark. If you have seen it for yourself, then you'll likely agree that we are given no warning. The shrimp just jumps at the camera. I would have preferred the light to flicker on and to witness a sharp-toothed monster charge at me for, you know, the IMAX 3D show. But I'm not the one making these special effects. It is so painfully obvious a CG shrimp. It's footage like this that leads me to believe they've discovered the whereabouts of Bikini Bottom. Why not just add a pineapple house and SpongeBob SquarePants? A Jim Henson Muppet would have been slightly less obvious. Something else which Robert Ballard got royally wrong is the location of Titanic's wreckage. We are told the Titanic can be found at the following co coordinates. And you can see it there, 41.7325 degrees north and 49.9469 degrees west. But that much is a lie. Ballard is mistaken. Those simply aren't the same coordinates given by the Titanic's final distress signals on the early morning hours of April 15th. I checked. Her original sinking site is 13.2 miles away. You will tell me Captain Smith didn't have a clue where he was and that the iceberg testified to that fact. Well then, how did Carpathia know where to answer Titanic's dist distress call? Am I expected to believe Captain Arthur Ronstron shared the same false coordinates as the Titanic 
or that the iceberg's victims floated 13 miles away? Well, which is it? The location of Ballard's discovery was an intended part of the deception. He wasn't the first that went out looking for it, and that's a problem. Nobody found the Titanic at its last reported whereabouts. You and I both know why that is. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. They had no other choice but to move the goalie net. Another nice touch to the Ballard discovery is the number of ghost shoes he either managed to document or recover in the whereabouts of the wreckage, particularly the little girl's shoes. Nothing hooks a person into the psychodrama quite like the thought of the poor little girl who wore those shoes. Not quite unlike the little girl who wrote that diary before landing in Auschwitz. But here at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, bacteria ate away at her flesh and bones, even her clothes, but somehow managed to leave behind a perfectly, uh, a practically perfect pair of leather shoes. You will tell me it's perfectly possible that everything would dissolve of the little girl but her pair of shoes for the museum. Well then, have you heard about, let's see if I can even pronounce this right, uh, Hello, Monus Titan um, Titanicae. I hadn't either until I set about to research this dribble. Hello, uh, hello. <laughs> okay, wait. Before I pronounce this again, I'm gonna drink more coffee. Hello, Monus Titanicae is apparently a thing, a real thing, and it's hungry. It even has its own Wikipedia article. Read it for yourself. It says um, that that bacteria is a germ-negative halophilic species of uh, proteobacteria, which was discovered on rusticles recovered from the wreck of the RMS Titanic. And this person here, Christina Sanchez Porro, uh, first isolated the bacterium in 2010 from a sample of rusticle obtained from the RMS Titanic in 1991. One of the researchers, uh, Hen Henrietta Mann, has estimated that the action of microbes like uh, Hellomonas titanicae may bring about the total destruction of the Titanic by 2030. As it turns out, the RMS Titanic has its very own species of rust-eating bacterium. That's why they named it after the Titanic, you know, because it conveniently cannot be found anywhere else in the world, but also because neither it nor the ship actually exist, except in the hearts of that Celine Dion song, which can be retrieved now within the bargain bin of every thrift store across America, in case you were looking for your very own copy. Anyhow, Hello, uh, Hello Monas Titanicae is causing rapid decay to the ship as we sit here and breathe. And here we can see our very own picture of it wreaking havoc while having absolutely no effect on the little girl's shoes, nor the bed mattresses and bed mattresses and first class furniture. Despite the super powers of teak, they estimate this newly discovered rust eating bacterium will completely digest the entire ship by twenty twenty five or at the latest by twenty thirty. Until that happens, they have UNESCO Psi to protect the site from grave robbers so that the bacteria can do its work. Seriously, I wish I were making this crap up, but I'm not. Meanwhile, when Buzz Aldrin isn't landing on the moon's uh, lava plain or vacationing on the South Pole, he's taking a yellow submarine down to the Titanic wreckage. Again, I'm not making it up. For whatever reason, the Bohemian Gro Grove people have decided that Buzz Aldrin is the sort of face that can sell Americans on totally made-up places. And looking at his military career, we, we can see he retired. it says he retired from the Navy as a commander in 1995, after reaching the salatory service limit. The Wikipedia has Ballard reti retiring from the Navy as a commander in 1995 after reaching the statutory uh, service limit. And I don't buy it. Ballard was still punching in the time card for another few years. He even had a picture of himself taken with his latest project, just to prove that fact. Titanic was still his baby. I'm willing to bet Robert Ballard was a set designer on the James Cameron movie. And even if the reported year of his retirement were legitimate, 
the Titanic movie was only released in 1997. That doesn't mean production began in 1997. In fact, we see right here, it says production began in 1995, when Cameron shot footage of the actual Titanic wreck. The modern scenes on the research vessel were shot on board the, um, whatever, whatever the name of that ship is. It's late, people. Which Cameron had used as a base when filming the wreck. And then it goes on to say, say scale models, computer-generated imagery, and a reconstructed reconstruction of the Titanic built at Baja Studios were used to recreate the sinking. I checked. Production began in 1995 as the year of Ballard's retirement. That just so happens to coincide with Cameron's shooting footage of the actual Titanic wreck, quote-unquote, in 1995. Wiki is quick to add that scale models of the Titanic and CGI were later used at the movie studio, but only for sinking purposes. The wreckage itself, we are assured, was the real deal. No wrecking models, I repeat, no wrecking models were employed for the making of that movie, because Hollywood would never lie about something like that. And yet, here we have a picture of James Cameron hanging out with his old intel buddy, Robert Ballard. If I'm not mistaken, that's a model of the Titanic. A little paint and polish would no doubt do wonders. It looks wrecked all the same. Giving us a tour of the wreckage site, huh? That's one thing I love about Hollywood. Hollywood has the habit of showing us how it's done. Okay, part two, 1912. That was all the intro, so now we can really dig in. Now that you have seen... Um, uh, that's weird. Okay, got another misprint here. Sorry about that. Uh, the RMS Titanic occurred in the early morning hours of April 15, 1912, some 370 nautical miles southeast of the coast, off the coast of Newfoundland, and only four days into her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City. But you and I know by now that that much is a lie. The Titanic never sank to begin with. It was a stage performance, and its passengers were actors. Right away, the historical sinking narrative presents some familiar oddities, the first of which is the day of its sinking, April 15th. I am quickly reminded that Lincoln died on that very date, April 15th, and that was a hoax. The Boston, bo the Boston bombing happened on April 15th. Another hoax. There are, of course, other honorable mentions. Notre Dame and Paris ritualistically burned on April 15th. The Virginia Tech shooting occurred on April 16th. Both Waco and Oklahoma City went down on April 19th, and the Columbine school shooting occurred on April 20th. Kent State happened on May 4th, a few short, a few short days too late. Still a hoax, though. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. was another April event. The month is a cyclic ritual for the occult, bathed in blood, both real and imagined. Baal and Moloch will have their sacrifices. Gotta keep painting those Easter eggs in blood, I guess. You will tell me it's all impossible. There were far too many ticketed passengers involved. Loose lips sink ships, and they couldn't shut, their, uh, they couldn't shut that number of gossipers up if they tried. Is that so? Actors surround us, and intel run everything. The longer I've been digging into these hoaxes, the more I've been asking myself how many people aren't in on it. Do you recall the Truman Show? Every person in Truman's life was an actor to the point that he was even bidding and attempting to father a child with one. Mind you, not everybody was an actor. Only those who entered the studio to fool Truman were actors. There were still a great many genuine people on the outside who were invited to watch the performance, not realizing that the joke was on them. I can only imagine, if there had ever been a sequel to The Truman Show, that Truman would step foot into the real world only to discover that it too was a movie studio, albeit a much larger one, being manipulated by a higher degree of actors. We read here, Titanic's passengers numbered approximately 1,317 people, 324 in the first class, 284 in second class, and 709 in third class. Um... And then we don't need to read the rest, I don't think. Our Titanic storytellers sometimes confess to the most famous vessel in the world being oddly underbooked on its maiden voyage, but only out of necessity. Mostly, they just lost right over that fact. It says right here that Titanic's passengers numbered approximately 1,317 people, adding 
The ship was considerably under capacity on her maiden voyage, as she could accommodate 2,453 passengers. That's 1,136 fares that failed to be sold at the ticket booth. Titanic was filled only at half capacity. The same can be said of Ford's Theater in Washington. Then again, so was American Airlines on September 11th, and the Pentagon. Come to think of it, they were all underbooked. And why do you think that is? They needed actors to plant their butts into those seats. Not real people. Look at all those people standing on Queenstown Dock. Spooks. Every one of them. And just so we're clear, they totally could have filled every seat on the airliners or the, in the theater with Intel personnel, and most certainly every cabin on the ship had they wanted to. There's no shortage of these canine clowns to go around. Still far too many, however, at any given time, who are needed for further work under their current role. Reassignment happens, but only out of necessity. That's why they have to spread out the killings. If you stop to think about it, though, many of Titanic's passengers, particularly those in the second and third class cabins, may have been in, uh, initiated into the regime via massive death and rebirth ceremony. You figure there was a naked neophyte getting ready to climb into a coffin when another closeted homo would win... Uh, Wait, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me repeat that, as unpleasant as that sentence is. You figure there was a naked neophyte getting ready to climb into a coffin with another closeted homo when somebody wearing an apron stopped him and said, grinning, Nuh-uh, I've got something better. How do you feel about ocean liners? The official explanation as to why so many people were disinterested makes absolutely no sense, as usual. Apparently, a coal strike kept ships from crossing, crossing the Atlantic, thereby frustrating foot traffic. Granted. Granted, Titanic was said to digest 825 tons of coal per day. A coal strike does not mean less people need to travel, though. If a coal strike were truly the problem, then I would naturally conclude, by way of deductive argument, that Titanic would be handicapped from leaving port, not the people. If a ship, however, is capable of making the journey, then people are too. I mean, they need a ship to carry them, correct? Nobody is expected to swim the entire way. Otherwise, that's like saying there's a fuel shortage on airplanes and so less people are interested or capable of filling the few that leave the tarmac. We then read, some of the most prominent people of the day booked a passage aboard Titanic, traveling in first class. And anyways, a coal strike didn't stop some of the most prominent people of the day from booking passage. Just the little people, I suppose. Those who couldn't afford first class or proper dental work thought it best to let the coal strike play out. Is that what it's saying? Lame. Meanwhile, the Titanic's maiden voyage enlisted 913 crewmen to serve its 1,317 ticketed passengers. I'll save you the trouble of pulling out your own calculator. There were an estimated 2,230 passengers in total, if we include the crew members. Those numbers seem to change, however, depending on the, upon the website, telling us that nobody can agree. But then consider this. There was one crew member for every 1.4 passengers. Wait, really? And here's some more math. How many second- or third-class tickets were sold for the servants of the 324 first-class passengers? The Titanic wasn't simply a spook convention. It was a pampered one. Of those remaining who weren't servants of the elite, you figure they filled desk positions and decided on an all-expense-paid holiday, courtesy of their employers. A little sea air does everybody good from time to time. And then, and then we finally get to it. It says right here, the exact number of people on board is not known, as many of those who book tickets fail to show. They name only 50, but then notice what comes next. Quote, not all of those who boarded stayed aboard for the entire journey. Unquote. Well, duh. Only 1,500 completed the journey to Halifax while the others decide, decided on rowboats. I can only assume, on an exoteric level, they're talking about those who departed from Southampton en route to, uh, I guess that's Cherborough, and decided to hang their hat there rather than America. I'm willing to bet those were real people who just so happened to book company with spooks, 
it happens all the time. The actual number of actors will likely never be known, as these operations are designed to keep us guessing. Where would a behemoth-sized Intel production be without a spoonful of predictive programming to, you know, help the medicine go down? That's precisely what we find with the sinking of the RMS Titanic. In 1898, this, this is unbelievable. In 1898, Morgan Robertson published a, nov- a novel called The Wreck of the Titan. I included a, a <laughs> the cover shot right there. Uh, the Wreck of the Titan, in which the an unsinkable British passenger liner with far too few rowboats hits an iceberg in the North Atlantic during the month of April and promptly sinks, killing nearly everybody on board. Oh dear. The Wikipedia is even pressed to admit that there, uh, quote, there are many close similarities with the real-life disaster of the RMS Titanic, unquote. Say it ain't so. Apparently, Titan was the same size, shape, and speed as the Titanic. Both even had the same passenger and crew capacity of 3,000, but sailed with just over 2,000. And they sank in precisely the same fashion. You know how there were cities among... uh, I'm sorry. You know how there were cries among Celine Dion music fans for a sequel to James Cameron's fictional Titanic movie? He should have made a prequel. Comparisons were undoubtedly made between the Titanic and... Uh, the book they based their operation upon in 1912, which was the intent all along. In a rather brazen move, Robertson released another edition of his Titan narrative in 1914, but then included a short story which described a future war pitted between the United States and the Empire of Japan. Once again, the wiki is pressed to make comparisons when stating, quote, Japan does not declare war, but instead launches sneak attacks on, uni- on the United States ships en route to the Philippines and Hawaii, unquote. Sure, they tell us it was a popular subject at the time, but I've already shown in papers such as this one, the Black Dahlia hoax, the predictive programming of war was being broadcasted to us by the same newspaper men who were in who were in on the other intel projects of their day. Not much else is known about Robertson. His bio is far too short-winded, probably because he worked a desk job, and the boys let him spin out a novel from time to time just to let a little steam out. We are told he rubbed shoulders with other New York bohemians, but that is perhaps only to grab intel from a rotunda of birdies on the window or recruit others into the game. Who really knows? We can attempt to imagine the scenarios, but Robertson was clearly one of them. On May 24, 1915, Robertson was found dead in his room at the um, Alamic Hotel in Atlantic City. He was 53 years old, and the story is a familiar one. Overdose. Let's get back to what I was saying earlier about false conclusions to be had. Coffee. J.P. Morgan has my interest in Titanic merely because he is all over the place in history and had his dirty little paws in everything. That interest was piqued recently when coming to learn of his and associate Charles Schwab's bed to hold the 1893 World Fair in either New York or Chicago. At the time, Morgan Cornelius Vanderbilt and William Waldorf, Waldorf Astor pledged $15 million to finance the fair if Congress awarded it to New York. The bid landed to Schwab in Chicago. It was while writing my paper on the Chicago World Fair hoax that I made a mental note of Vanderbilt, but also of William Waldorf Astor. Recognize the name Astor? You should. John Jacob Astor IV, quote-unquote, died, the richest man on board Titanic. He and William Waldorf Astor were first cousins. All the names mentioned here were heavily invested in Intel Psyops, but also the scrubbing of his story, the Millennial Kingdom of Messiah, of which the World Fairs is no exception. Just look at J.P. Morgan's heavy hand in developing and merging a railroad empire. The railroads already existed before the worldwide mud flood events, but the writers of history don't want us to know about that. We even see Morgan heavily invested in both Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. Why am I not surprised? Free electricity was another component of life before the mud flood, but not anymore. Morgan made certain of that. 
His house at 210 Madison Avenue was the quote-unquote first electrically lit private residence in New York, as the official narrative would have it, a move which came because of his financing the Edison Electric Illuminating Company in 1878. There is far more worth mentioning, particularly his active part in shaping a false perception of the American West. But that is best budgeted for another time, as the subject of this paper is the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Here we see the um, um, on the wiki page for the Federal Reserve Act was passed by the 63rd United States Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson on December 23, 1913. The law created the Federal Reserve System, the central banking system of the United States. Regardless, people keep arriving in my neck of the woods and attempting to explain how Titanic was targeted by Morgan so that the Federal Reserve might be created in 1913. The Federal Reserve Act was passed by the 63rd United States Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson on December 23, 1913. Wow, that just happens to be today's date. How ironic is that? Nearly two years after the Titanic psychodrama. The theory is that Morgan needed Isidore Strauss, John Jacob Astor, and Benjamin Guggenheim to go bye-bye. And so he coaxed them into a sa savory trap, much as Elmer Fudd would with Bugs Bunny, but in the form of a luxury ocean liner. Though the Federal Reserve most certainly thrust humanity even further along down the slave plantation alley, its formation was already underway in 1912, particularly through the manufactured panic of 1907. I can't find anything which, which suggests Strauss, Astor, or Guggenheim were opposed to what Morgan and the Rothschilds were cooking. Frankly, I don't think Intel was thinking with such sophistication. And like the Rothschilds, Guggenheim was a Jew, as his name suggests. My research, has, my research has shown me time and time again that our controllers were all in on it together. There are multiple reasons as to why Strauss, Astor, and Guggenheim would want to go away. I can think of several right this very moment, and you probably can too. In every single picture that I can find of Astor, he looked bored out of his mind. You will see what I mean when we finally get to him. The motionless plane is probably far larger than most have ever dared to dream. Perhaps Titanic was Astor's exit plan, a one-way passage to the other side of the greater realm. Also, it is Guggenheim's valet, Victor Giglio, who was a runner-up for the best line in the scripted psychodrama. I bring this up now because my time is limited, and I fear we will not return to him. After being aroused from sleep shortly after midnight on April 15th, Giglio is quoted as saying, Never mind icebergs. What is an iceberg? There are far too many repeated lines in the Titanic affair, and so, I only conclude... Giglio gifted us with some brilliant improv. Bravo. And now for the Vanderbilts, because really, it would behoove me to snub their part in this while moving forward. They are, as you're now aware, the other conspirators in J.P. J. Morgan's attempt to, to shut the pie holes of any opponents to the Federal Reserve. What my research has shown me, however, is that the Vanderbilts are bigger hoaxers than anyone. They were master manipulators of the media since day one. If anyone could dock Titanic in Halifax and have it completely unnoticed by the gullible public, then it was this family. Specifically, it is George Washington Vanderbilt II, whom we are teased with this time around. All we are really told of him is that he was an uh, quote-unquote art collector and member of the prominent Vanderbilt family. Yep, art collector. The Vanderbilt family amassed a huge fortune through any number of business ventures, mostly railroads, though. Railroads telling us that they were making the big bucks stealing what had already existed, and then lying to everyone about it. Nice people. Not George Washington Vanderbilt II, though. He was simply a recipient of all that money, and so settled to being an art collector. From his picture alone, I could have told you that he was a spoiled child. But then there is the matter of Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. After growing deathly bored of living in one residence or another, we are told he acquired, interesting wording, 125,000 acres of pristine woodland in North Carolina, wherewith he employed architect Richard Morris Hunt to design a limestone house modeled after Chateau de Blois and other chateaux of the Loire Valley in France. 
If you happen to read my paper on the 1893 Chicago World Fair or any of my other Millennial Kingdom plus Mud Flood pieces, then you should know by now that Vanderbilt had absolutely nothing designed and constructed in North Carolina. We even read that it, it had a whopping four acres worth of floor space, causing many to, con con uh, to conclude Biltmore is the largest dwelling ever constructed in the United States. The thing is, if the Biltmore estate looks like a chateau from the Loire Valley in France, then it's because it was probably built at the same time and by the same people as the Loire Valley. We have already been given a confession. George Washington Vanderbilt II was an art collector. The Vanderbilts had a heavy hand in scrubbing his story, and in the case of Georgie, who dolefully drifted from one residence to another, he had no problem moving into a mansion, which... Uh, was owned by a Millennial Kingdom saint. Even his Titanic survival story describe, describes Georgie's character in sweeping form and involves art. In 1912, we are told that he and his wife, Edith uh, Stuvescent Dresser, booked passage on the fated ship. I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised, though, if he got inside word on what Morgan and the Vanderbilts were cooking up and wanted in on the action. Even after a hundred years, I can still hear the sigh of our controllers, always having to give George Washington Vanderbilt II something to do. We are even told that he got cold feet only hours before Operation Iceberg was a go, on the basis that a family member explained to him, so many things can go wrong on a maiden voyage. Really? That's what we're going with? Sure. Hey, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the quote is invented. If anything, I'm saying it's legit. Either George didn't want to freeze his butt off in the cold Atlantic in a lifeboat, or it finally occurred to him what playing a dead person would entail. At any rate, George Washington Vanderbilt II got cold feet and booked passage on the Olympic instead. But not before his 24-year-old footman, Edwin Charles Wheeler, had brought their baggage and precious art on board several days before departure. Bummer. Looks like Wheeler had to go through with their little operation after all. Make sure none of the crisis actors ran off with Napoleon's chess set. An often reproduced photograph, which I have shown above, has Wheeler walking on the deck of the Titanic with passengers Ada and Elsie Doling. His body was never recovered, but lots of people's bodies were never recovered. Wheeler was undoubtedly one of those who docked safely in Halifax with dry boots, slept soundly through the night of August 15th, I shouldn't wonder, and then ate a late breakfast, for all I know. There was another Vanderbilt who had booked passage onto Titanic's maiden voyage, a certain Alfred uh, Gwynne Vanderbilt. Alfred was George's nephew and son of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. I checked. He, too, got cold feet. I would say the Vanderbilts weren't much in the way of field operatives, but then there's the matter of everybody's favorite Vanderbilt, CNN's Anderson Cooper. I'm sure they all made Mommy and Daddy proud, though. Correction. <laughs> Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt did get around to booking passage onto another ship, and it was the RMS Lusitania. Are you kidding me? I seriously wish they were, but they're not. Look, I'm not the writer of history. I simply report on it. How do these people keep a straight face while clapping away at the typewriter, inventing these scripts? If you're rusty at 11th grade U.S. history and need a refresher, the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat on May 7, 1915, some 11 miles off the coast of Southern Ireland, killing 1,198 passengers and crew. The Lusitania is the event which led to America's involvement in the First World War, as if false flag uh, ship sinking wasn't already a tired genre by then. Now we know why Alfred backed out of the Titanic. Once again, we are shown no pictures of its fiery end or sinking, only newspaper cartoons and stories, crisis actor stories backed by cartoons, perhaps even from the same cast and crew who gave us the Titanic. Undoubtedly, this was the bigger budgeted sequel, and the stakes were higher. In the 18 minutes before it sank, Vanderbilt removed his life belt and placed it upon Alice Middleton, who was holding her baby and had in a life belt of her own. There, he told her, that's for your lovely smile. Famous last words, apparently. Are we expected to believe the sinking was real and that his demise was a cruel fate? 
If so, then what Alfred should have told Alice Middleton is, crikey, the sinking of the Titanic was faked, but this one is legit. Returning once again to the Titanic sinking narrative on April 15th, it went down at precisely 2.20 a.m., and yet the New York Herald managed a full-page layout that very day, as if that's not suspicious. Look at the cut and copy job. It's practically a family photo album for the children of Cain. It not only involves an illustration of the Titanic hitting an iceberg, complete with an X marks the spot on a map, but actually picture, uh, pictures of the famed casualties on board. Tell me that's not suspicious. Rescuers wouldn't have even been able to make a complete sweep of the waters yet. Uh, for weeks, actually. The first casualties they mention are John Jacob Astor and Isidore Strauss, opponents of J.P. Morgan and the Federal Reserve. So now, you know what narrative they were going with from the get-go. Dangling the bait for conspiracy theorists, I see. All too easy. Another abnormality which the Herald manages, manages to get right, or wrong, depending upon your perspective, is numbering 1,800 people. You will tell me there were 2,230 in total, including crewmen, but I'm willing to bet there were far less people on board than what the writers of history care to admit. The only dead people were phantoms to begin with. The New York Herald claims 1,800 on board, with only 675 saved. The New York Tribune tells us there were 2,226 on board, with 866 rescued. For added reinforcement, they drew the Titanic's path on a globe. Simply adorable. The New York Advocate placed 2,209 people on the boat with 868 survivors. The Detroit Free Press agrees with the 868 recovered, but then manages a kill count totaling 1,342. By April 19th, we can even see the quote-unquote official death list elevated to 1,635 persons, a victim manifest which surpasses even today's kill count. How in the world are so many papers getting it wrong? It's not like White Star Line didn't wire the media, it's manifest. The newspaper people still managed to scramble the numbers, but as, as I've already mentioned, this is a psyop and the state of confusion is purposeful. New York American throws a rather wide range of dead out there. 1,200 to 1,500 dead. Makes you wonder how the other papers settled on such precise numbers. They even admit the possibility that J.J. Astor was only lost on Titanic, but not necessarily dead. Keeping the public glued to their butts and on the edge of their seat, while the numbers ricocheted up and down and then around in circles on the charts, it's just one of the ways they sucked them into the psychodrama. And yet somehow, after all the numbers, the numbers crunching, the evening sun in Baltimore did not receive the memo. We read on its cover page in all caps, and I quote, All Titanic passengers are safe, transferred in lifeboats at sea. What the, huh? Did they not commit to a thorough proofread before sending their latest story to press? They went with the iceberg narrative, but then decided to skip the part where the Titanic went under. I take a sentence like that to mean precisely as it's worded. All passengers on board the Titanic was or were transferred into lifeboats and are therefore still counted among the living. Hard to read that in any other light. Must have had their wires crossed. But then notice the portrait of Captain Smith. They're giving us a message. Nothing about these newspaper stories are an accident. The captain did not go down with the ship, but more on him in a moment. Titanic must have been a time machine of some sort. The iceberg created an alternate timeline so that even the newspapers were split in the paradox because the Syracuse Herald went with the same narrative as the Evening Sun. It reads in bold letters, Titanic's passengers all rescued. What I should have said is, the New York Herald got it mostly correct, or rather, righter than the others. Claiming 1,800 on board is less than the official narrative, which insists there were 2,240. But here we see the Syracuse going with an even lower number, 1,300. Getting closer to the actual figure, I shouldn't wonder. 
I know it says 1,300 passengers, but are we really to believe every crew member stayed behind and perished? No, because even the iceberg story derives from an alternate universe. Here we see an um, illustration detailing a head-on collision. Nothing went under. The 1,300 likely includes the sailors. We then read, giant new liner limping in towards Halifax, badly damaged. See, nobody perished. Titanic lived to see another day. Kind of makes you wonder what, why are these newspaper men intercepted. Still makes a little difference, though. The reality is that all wires ultimately lead to the same building, and Intel is screwing with everyone. Different typewriter of uh, cigarette-smoking chimp, perhaps, but same address. I would tell you this is what really happened, that Titanic limped into Halifax, but even the iceberg story is a lie. The Titanic never hit an iceberg, unless they purposely drove it into one. I wouldn't put it past sociopath. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, oh, I, I need to drink more coffee. Hold on here. That's better. I wouldn't put it past sociopaths to commit the deed. But why go to all the trouble when the hoax was intended as a mass drowning? That's the problem with chronic liars. The lies are ever-present even while attempting to dish out the truth. The fake news was intended to add to the confusion. And then we read this from the Detroit News. Titanic's uh, 1,470 passengers taken off in mid-ocean without loss of life. This is getting ridiculous, but I think I know what is happening. Intel outlined a false plot point in advance to members of the press, hoping to keep them on their toes. That way, should somebody in the press have loose lips and leak the narrative, Intel would still have a crutch to lean on by claiming, no, you got it wrong. God really did sink this ship. Also, that person would never have a job behind a typewriter again. Today, Hollywood employs this tactic all the time. They either leak false plot points or lie about the obvious simply to get a rise out of everyone. With 1,470 passengers, I'm still going with the estimates given to us by Syracuse, though, which is 1,300. All right, so here we see the lifeboats, according to the Wikipedia, the lifeboats of the RMS Titanic played a crucial role in the disaster of uh, 14, uh, April 14th, through the 15th, 1912, the ship had 20 lifeboats that, in total, could accommodate 1,178 people. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm going with less, far less. Our writers of history include only 20 lifeboats, accommodating a total of 1,178 people, which is slightly over half of the 2,223 reported passengers. Totally ridiculous. That's the number I'm going with then. 1,178, or rather, there were no more than 1,178 on board. That number is still incorrect, though, as they didn't even manage to fill each lifeboat up to capacity. It says 18 lifeboats were used, loading between 11.45 p.m. and 2.15 a.m., though collapsible boat A floated off the ship's uh, partially submerged deck, and collapsible boat B floated away upside down minutes before the ship upended and sank. I take that back. They didn't even manage to utilize every lifeboat, telling us there were even less people on board. Far less. Maybe several hundred at best. You will tell me that collapsible boats A and B floated away and that the people could not get to it fast enough. Exactly. They floated away once the ship sank. Nobody needed them. It says, uh, continuing, Boat 7 was the first to be launched at about 12.40 a.m. Under the supervision of First Officer Murdoch, supported by Fifth Officer Lowe, it had a capacity of 65 people, but was lowered with only 28. Boat 7 was the first to be launched. Why would the very first boat be a collapsible one? There were only two of them. Actually, that's probably a uh, misprint. There were only three of them. Seems like you'd save the collapsible no, I think there are maybe, whatever, whatever. I'd have to look at it again. Seems like you'd save the collapsible boats for last, but what do I know? Let's just go with it. We read that it had a capacity of 65 people, but was lowered with only 28 on board. The two officers even tried to encourage passengers to board, but they were reluctant to do so. We are constantly fed the dribble detailing the fight to climb onto each raft, even though many to most of them were only half filled. But that but that they gave up the ghost before anyone thought to fill the final two. 
And yet, here we see that everyone was too lethargic to do anything about it. Well, which is it? Surely, Titanic's passengers understood full well that half of them were sitting ducks, even if the ship didn't sink. People had places to be. New York is the sort of city which never sleeps. Chop, chop. If Titanic wasn't taking them, then lifeboats would do the trick. We are furthermore expected to believe the men were far too noble to accompany their women, even though orders were being shouted at them to abandon ship. Are you seriously going to try and convince me that the wealthiest people in the world would stand around on the deck smoking cigarettes rather than, rather than thaw out their frozen asses in a lifeboat? In the real world, even if the lifeboat shortage narrative were remotely true, it is the elite, first and foremost, who would be saved. And then their dogs. Their servants would fill in the remaining seats. Everybody else could bend over into the fetal position and kiss their caboose while the Titanic takes her final bow. The entire Titanic narrative was written for a gullible public and only seems credible for those who don't have the slightest clue how the motionless place re plane really operates. For whatever reason, this, uh, this caption here um, kind of lifted up on the page. Um, but it says uh, it talks about Dorothy Gibson. Uh, it says, was a pioneering American silent film actress, artist, model, and singer active in the early 20th century. She is best remembered as a survivor of the sinking of the Titanic and for starring in the first motion picture based on the disaster. Among Boat 7's passengers were John Pillsbury Snyder, grandson of the one and only John S. Pillsbury of, you know, the Pillsbury line, but also businessman Dickinson Bishop, who reportedly dressed like a woman to receive admittance. Also, a woman's dog. But then we have Dorothy Gibson. The wiki lists her as a pioneering American silent film actress, as if that's not suspicious. We are then told she is best remembered as a survivor of the sinking of the Titanic, but also for starring in the first motion picture based upon the disaster in the same breath. You've got to be kidding me. We are even provided with a promo photo for her Titanic movie. Hard to tell if she's waving for help or hiling Hitler. It then says, in 1911, Dorothy Gibson began a six-year love affair with married movie tycoon Jules Brulatour, head of distribution for Eastman Kodak and co-founder of Universal Pictures. Uh, uh, Brolatour was also an advisor and producer for Eclair. He backed several of Gibson's films, including her 1912 hit, Saved from the Titanic. By 1912, Dorothy Gibson had already starred in her first seven films. In 1912, the year of the disaster, she would go on to star in another 18, one of which was the Titanic movie, Saved from the Titanic. Though if we add the actual Titanic psychodrama into her credentials, we can clock her 1912 performances in at 19. In 1911, Dorothy Gibson began a six-year love affair with married movie tycoon Jules uh, Brulatour, head of distribution for Eastman Kodak and co-founder of Universal Pictures. But I'm sure that's all just a coincidence. Also, a, qu a coincidence that Gibson only began acting in 1911 and then retired from movie making in 1912, soon as the Titanic movie was made. Apparently, the Titanic film was so bad that nobody in the film industry thought it worth preserving. In fact, every single film which Dorothy Gibson has ever made but one has conveniently been scrubbed from history. The wiki gives us a few other juicy tidbits to chew on, though. For whatever reason, Dorothy was the inspiration for the fictional character Susan Alexander Kane in Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. Wait, what? Why or how, we are not told, but then we read the following. A Nazi sympathizer and alleged intelligence operative, Dorothy renounced her involvement by 1944. Dorothy was a Nazi sympathizer and an alleged intelligence operative. Tell us something we don't know. Post edit. Found something I didn't know, and here it goes. Lifeboat, Lifeboat 7 was launched without its plug, causing water to leak onto, into the bottom of the boat. Wait, is this a sex joke? I think this is a sex joke, but I'm not certain. Let's keep reading to find out. It is Gibson who told the story, later adding, this was, uh, this was remedied by volunteer 
con contributions from the lingerie of the women and the garments of the men. Unbelievable. <laughs> they stopped the sinking ship with their lingerie. Unbelievable. Here we are shown several of the very lifeboats which are said to have rescued passengers from the sinking ship in the Atlantic, but with several stolen people who wanted to be included in the photograph. And just to prove the validity of their claim that these boats did indeed derive from the Titanic, we can even see the words RMS Titanic imprinted on the one closest to us. How adorable. It's a fake. You can obviously tell somebody took the time to add sticky letters onto a photograph and then pass it off as the real thing, as no other boat has them. Even the Wikipedia is pressed to admit the photo has been doctored. But then they have the goal to pass it off as a legitimate photo anyways. I keep getting asked why our controllers would lie about the sinking of an ocean liner. Well, why would they fake photographs? And here we see a photograph of the lifeboats pulling up to the RMS Carpathia. The one closest to us doesn't look anything like the lifeboat shown in the doctored photo, but let's just go with it. We are told Carpathia rescued the 493 surviving passengers and 212 crewmen, or 705 altogether, at precisely 4 a.m. Does that look like 4 in the morning to you? There's far too much light. It's the North Atlantic Ocean in April. The sun wouldn't even rise over Halifax until 629. Are we, sub are we expected to believe they stood around in the boats freezing their butts off for nearly three hours waiting on the photographer? If I had to guess, the only reason why we are given a vertical glance is because the RMS Titanic had not yet split the scene. The wealthiest people stayed behind. Perhaps a few of them stood on the deck to smoke a cigarette and see them off, but mostly they just slept in. It would be left to Captain Smith and his crew to ensure that the crisis actors were safely dropped into the water and then successful in paddling from point A to point B, which is the RMS Carpathia. On closer inspection, it doesn't even look like the RMS Carpathia they've pulled up to. This is the postcard picture of Carpathia often provided for us. Do they look the same to you? When given a peripheral vision, the whole of Carpathia is painted black. I'm seeing a barely distinct black stripe in the lifeboat photo and nothing else. Perhaps it is only a perspective issue. Who really knows? But then how far over the railing was the photographer leaning when he nabbed that shot? Oh, look, <laughs> an actual picture of the iceberg that brought down the RMS Titanic. So glad that somebody managed to go back and look for it. Another fake. Clearly not a real photograph. At best, it's a composite imaging. I'm calling the iceberg for what it is, though, and it's a mate, uh, it's a mate painting. Somebody decided to get experimental with the watercolors. The Wikipedia even suggests that a streak of red paint from a ship's hole can be reportedly found etched into one side of the berg. But not, but not even they want to commit, as they claimed it was the red paint from, quote, a ship's hole, unquote, which is not the same thing whatsoever as, ide as identifying the hole of Titanic. Do you see the red streak they're insinuating? That's a terrible contrast of light and shadow as paintings go. Then again, the artist could only find employment with the government, so it is what it is. Seems like they're missing the entire potential of an iceberg. There's a reason we say things like, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. It's because what we can see is only a preview of how large and massive the entirety is underneath. We are expected to believe the berg dropped straight down and that the Titanic managed a clean swipe along its edge. How much of Titanic's red paint was visible above the waterline? Very little. Are we to believe Titanic dwarfed the berg that brought her down? Please. Titanic would have plowed through that cube like a lawnmower over Lego pieces. Then again, another possibility is that the RMS Titanic split from the scene and the whereabouts of its scheduled sinking. It would have been an uncomfortable two hours floating around in the Atlantic, but the RMS Carpathia was sure to arrive and collect its crisis actors. Less people would need bought off that way. It would also give the crisis actors a practice run, getting their story straight with the sailors and seeing how a live audience re reacts to them. I'm still going with my first suggestion that Carpathia pulled right alongside Titan right alongside Titanic, but you never really know. Somewhere around 8 a.m., Carpathia split for New York. 
That's only a four-hour window from arrival to departure. Strange that they made no further rescue attempts, but you and I, you and I both know why. Recovery of the dead wouldn't would not begin for another two days. The Mackay Bennett, refitted as a morgue ship, didn't even leave Halifax until April 17th. When it did arrive on the 19th of April, Captain Frederick H. uh, Lardner claimed there were too many bodies bobbing around in their life jackets to recover, and not enough embalming supplies or coffin. That's why they left some of the bodies behind, you see. The Canadian government and associated burial and maritime laws dictated that any dead bodies had to be embalmed before a ship entered port. No exceptions would be made here. No rescue attempt was attempted by the Americans. How convenient. Nobody thought to document the 333 recovered dead bodies, said to be bobbing over the surface of the water. That's right there were 333 of them recovered, telling us that the Masonic Captain Lardner only decided upon 333 coffins and embalming supplies for immediate purposes, as if that's not suspicious. Passing notes in class again, are we? When it comes to all those bobbing bodies, uh, uh, excuse me, when it comes to all those bodies bobbing around in the waves, though, we're only given this dribble, a picture of the capsized rowboat, which... Nobody on board thought worth their while. Likely a last-minute improv after they've stretched all their crisis actors out as far as they could onto the other 18 lifeboats. All I'm seeing here is that there were no bodies to discover. Not one body in the rescue boat. None whatsoever. And who snapped the rescuer's photo from such great height? Must have been taken from the mass of the Mackie Bennett. That's probably a given. It's just not how these rescue photos are advertised to us. We are told they paddled around for hours, painstakingly nabbing bodies. Presently, though, they're all looking up at the camera. Does anybody else find that strange? It looks posed. I'm guessing the professional photographer instructed them to say cheese. Make sure to show their good side, too, seeing as how this was likely to land in the papers. Lander, furthermore, had the uncanny ability to identify the richest men on board, men like John Jacob Astor IV, including the entire first-class cabin, which, while dumping 113 third-class passengers back at sea. So nice of them that they thought to bring a priest along. Let me ask you something. How in the world do you differentiate the floating, bloated carcasses of a first-class ticket holder from a third-class ticket holder? Were they wearing Monopoly Man monocles with their pajamas? Did they have tickets in their pocket? Did the first-class deck have different colored life jackets? Perhaps the Mackey Bennett carried a portfolio of everyone's mugshots. You tell me. Canadian authorities were apparently only interested in identifying the wealthy-looking, as one-third of the bodies were never identified or claimed. And why do you think that is, hmm? Remember how half of the names on the World Trade Center death list didn't even have a social security number, or how their families never came forward? Almost half of the bodies gathered by Captain Lardner and his crew were assigned numbers and buried in mass in Halifax. Finally, we're given an actual dead body to work with. Is it a corpse, though? If only they'd shown us one of the identified bodies. That would have been nice. Every caption that I can find of this photo simply reads, quote, Titanic victim being embalmed, on board the Mackie Bennett, unquote. Must have been one of those bodies thrown into unmarked graves. Despite being photographed too, a hundred years have passed and nobody once claimed to know this guy. It sure would have been nice to see somebody getting embalmed who had friends, but that's too much to ask of our storytellers. J.J. Astor had plenty, but alas, no picture to show his embalming, or his body for that matter. How is this photo not posed? An officer gazes at the camera while the embalmer looks busy and somebody else peeks around the corner for laughs. In this photo, we are told one entire month has passed since the sinking of the Titanic and rescue parties are still on a search for the missing. So much effort for rescuers laboring to pull up bodies only to dump them back in again for lack of maritime law supplies. Why would they do that? Nobody was claiming these people. Mind you, looking at this photo, I haven't the faintest clue if it's May of 1912 or June of 1917. All I see is a picture of sailors pulling up to a rope ladder, still not seeing any proof of the bobbing bodies. 
And then we read from the Wikipedia, there are, uh, quote, there are conflicting accounts of Smith's death. In the days and weeks following Titanic's disappearance, crisis actors were planted among the newspapers. Stories were told. And as you'd expect, contradictions became even worse than what we've seen in the recovery efforts. Right off the bat, Captain Smith was given a dozen different ways to die. The Wikipedia introduces his demise to us by stating, there are conflicting accounts of Smith's death, before proceeding to explain any number of ways in which he might have died, depending, of course, upon who was telling the story. The most often repeated ones derive from our favorite newspaper, the New York Herald, where a certain Robert Williams Daniel, who claims to have jumped from the stern immediately before the ship sank, Witness Captain Smith drown in the ship's wheelhouse. Daniel quotes, I saw Captain Smith on the bridge. My eyes seemingly clung to him. The deck from which I had leapt from was immersed. The water had risen slowly and was now to the floor of the bridge. Then it was to Captain Smith's waist. I saw him no more. He died a hero. Contrarily, junior Marsoni officer Harold Bride has Captain Smith taking a dive off the bridge just as collapsible B was levered off the roof of the officer's quarters. Here, Wiki adds, it is a story corrobor- corroborated by first-class passenger Mrs. Eleanor Widener, who was in lifeboat number four, the closest to the sinking ship at the time. And next we find several varying accounts claiming Smith attempted to swim towards the overturned collapsible B life raft, though Colonel Archibald Gracie only insinuated the swimmer to be his beloved captain. He claimed to have told the mystery man, hold on to what you have, old boy. One more of you aboard would sink us all. How convenient. To which the swimmer replied with an air of authority, all right, boys, good luck and God bless you. Why would anybody tell the captain of the ship to buzz off? Fireman Walter Hurst tried to reach Smith with an oar, but the rapidly rising swell carried him away. From here, recounted stories take a dive for the worse. Excuse the pun. We hear of a heroic Smith jumping ship, but with an unidentified child in his arms to the boat. Two passengers on board, collapsible B, Harry Sr., one of Titanic Stokers, and second-class passenger Charles Eugene Williams, Both claimed that Smith presented the child, but then turned back, shouting, I will follow the ship. Who is this child? We are never told. William's version is even more colorful. Apparently, upon learning that First Officer Murdoch had perished, as if anybody would know of his fate at that point, Smith, quote, pushed himself away from the lifeboat, threw his life belt from him, and slowly sank from our sight. He did not come to the surface again, unquote. The wiki is quick to admit, these accounts are most certainly apocryphal. Oh, gee, you think? That's the problem with crisis actors. They're great for sticking to the lie among cheap paychecks, but can never seem to get their story straight. Wiki is even pressed to admit that newspapers are literally inventing Smith's famous last words. Be British, boys. Be British. Also, that our continued knowledge of those words is an often regurgitated product of Hollywood. They blame shift the British press as if that's supposed to cure the headaches of cognitive dissonance. Sure, the uh, British newspapers have Smith taking a gun to his head, but the American media doesn't fare any better. It's rather difficult for me to take any of this seriously when in fact the original reports are admittedly lies of the newspaper men. I guess it's a good thing that our writers of history have sorted it all out for us so that we are no longer expected to think for ourselves. In case you were wondering, that last line is sarcasm. I'm trying to steer clear of it, but they're not making it easy. Victims' bodies had barely been rounded up and either towed ashore or dumped back in before Captain Smith was discovered alive in the streets of Baltimore. Oops. The July 1912 encounter was reported by Peter Pryall, former quartermaster on the steamship Majestic of the White Star Line, of which Edward John Smith was its captain. Pryall apparently even observed Titanic's captain two mornings in a row. Attired in neat-fitting business suit of a light brown color, straw hat, and tan shoes, and carrying two briefcases. Pryall then stood on the corners of Baltimore and St. Paul for nearly an hour, hoping for another sighting. 
According to his report, not even his own wife believed he'd show. Well, guess what? He showed. Pryall called out after him, Captain Smith, how are you? The man answered, Very well, Pryall, but please don't detain me. I'm on business. Pryall followed him. Upon realizing his error, Smith hurried into the Calvert building, uh, the Calvert building, endeavoring to lose himself in the crowd. He then scurried onto a cable car. Though Pryall managed to climb on board, Smith hopped off at the Washington, Baltimore, and Annapolis station and scampered towards another. Pryall, Pryall did not make the transfer in time. It was their final meeting. He then told his encounter to the press on the following day and never filed another report. My favorite part of Pryall's story, though, derives from the offices of White Star Management, wherein they felt the need to respond to the media with the following memo. Uh, you could see it right there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but that's a, a copy of the original. Some might argue that former quartermaster Peter Pryall had a pie hole needing shut, but that's not how I see it. The Evening Sun didn't host a picture of Captain Smith complete with the caption which read, All Titanic passengers are safe, transferred in lifeboats at sea, without reason. Slapping everyone's face with the truth, but then immediately reassigning it to the garbage bin of fake news has long been an intel tactic. It was all part of the regime since day one. Need I remind you, though, Peter Pryall was not some trucker who overdosed on Cheetos and then sat down at a Midwest coffee shop only to be visited by an apparition of Elvis. The Witness Protection Program did not officially exist in 1912. Nobody, not even Pryall, thought along those lines. Or if they did, our writers of history have done a good job at scrubbing their claims to conspiracy. And I wouldn't doubt it if that's true. Still, getting people to disappear in the early 20th century decades before television, was easily accomplished. All they needed to do is bump someone over a town or two, so long as they had a Masonic Lodge to report into. No questions asked. The witness, the witness protection, I'm sorry, the witness security program was authorized by the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970 and amended by the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. According to Wiki, the U.S. Marshals have protected, relocated, and given new identities to more than 8,600 witnesses and 9,900 of their family members since the program began in 1971. Aside from the fact that I am given absolutely no reason to trust these numbers, they want the collective consciousness to conclude that it is organized crime whom these people must be protected from, when in fact relocation is more likely apportioned to hoaxers like Captain Smith and his merry crew. Thomas Andrews Jr. was the naval architect in charge of designing Titanic. He, too, perished during her maiden voyage, and like Captain Smith, very few crisis actors seem to agree on the exact circumstances surrounding his fate. The wiki has a terrible time keeping up with their juggling act. We first read of John Stewart, a steward on the ship, who claimed he saw Andrews sitting alone in the first-class smoking room with arms folded, a life built lying on a nearby table. Stewart asked him, aren't you going to have a try for it, Mr. Andrews? Probably need a good British accent with that. Andrews, however, didn't answer or move, apparently in a state of shock. The time, according to Stewart, was approximately 2.05 a.m. That's a mistake. Even the wiki is forced to admit it. I've personally grilled crisis actors and can tell you they often slip up when giving the time. You really think they wouldn't, and that their production directors would advise them from walking into a trap during interviews. There are far too many constraints and easily detected contradictions when working with the clock, particularly when improv is involved. But a hundred years later, and they're still attempting to outwit the long and short hand. Not my problem. Stewart's story ended up in Andrew's biography, which just so happened to be published that very year, in 1912. Man, they were just hitting this psyop from every possible angle, weren't they? Only problem is, Stewart had already left the ship in lifeboat number 15 at approximately 1.40 a.m., nearly 30 minutes before hanging with Andrews in the first-class smoking room. Stewart really didn't think that one through, did he? But crisis actors aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. Why raise the bar? From there, the inconsistencies continued. 
we next read of another Andrew sighting at 2 o'clock a.m., an astonishing five minutes before Stewart's encounter, wherein Andrew shouted at the women to abandon ship. Apparently, the women weren't interested in messing up their makeup and hair. When arousing their blood didn't work, he began frantically throwing deck chairs into the ocean for people to use as flotation devices. Such a contrast between Stewart's encounter and the others would normally cause me to pause and contemplate which, if any, is Andrew's getting into full character. The far easier conclusion, however, is that none of these encounters happen to begin with, as all were given are imaginative stories. It is mess steward Cecil Fitzpatrick who built upon the harrowing dive which others had reported of Captain Smith seconds before the bridge submerged, adding that it is Andrews and Smith who took the dive together. The award for the greatest crisis actor goes out to Molly Brown. Easily. Here we see Molly handing an award to Captain Arthur Henry Rostrand for his service in the rescue of survivors of the Titanic. But don't be fooled. It is Molly who deserves one. When it came to the Titanic psychodrama, nobody did it better. She may even be the greatest crisis actor of all time. Her story technically begins with Mark Twain. No, I'm not making this stuff up. The writers of history are, and I'm just reporting on it. Irish American Magazine has Mark Twain meeting Brown while a waitress in Missouri and then sitting her on a quest for riches in the Rockies. We've seen Agent Twain pop up randomly before, and to the point that I'm beginning to think his endorsement, whether real or fictional, is code word for somebody who's been recruited. Anyhow, it is there where she met James Joseph Brown, the manager of a silver mine. After two children and a separation, we then find a flamboyant Maggie Brown traveling around Europe, gaining acceptance into a society of wealthy Americans which is to say they weren't wealthy Americans living in America. Probably just a nice, nice way of saying she was rubbing shoulders with the right people for a psyop such as this. Maggie Brown, international woman of espionage and intrigue. The 1964 musical starring Debbie Reynolds, who was Carrie Fisher's mom, the unsinkable Molly Brown, and the 1960 Broadway production upon which it was based, has Molly's husband becoming jealous and leaving for America after the attention of a European prince is cast upon her. Realizing that Johnny is her true love, Johnny's her husband, Molly sets sail on board the RMS Titanic. That's a far better version than the one which the writers of history have decided to go with now, but it is what it is. Point being, I'm trying to recollect another crisis actor in history whose bio ended up becoming a Broadway musical, and can't think of any. We read this in Wikipedia. Brown assisted in fundraising for Denver's Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, which was completed in 1911. Blink and you'll miss it. Molly assisted in fundraising for the construction of Denver's Cathedral of Immaculate Conception, which was completed in 1911. Wonderful story and all, but that's a mud flood building, meaning its original day of construction takes us hundreds of years earlier than what we're being told. Molly Brown had no part in anything but pocketing money for the intel community. Funny, the construction of mud flood buildings is probably how she got her feet wet, a trick of the trade she may have learned among her American friends in Europe. Speaking of rich friends... Brown spent the first months of 1912 in Paris as part of the John Jacob Astor IV Ensemble. If you wanted to pull off a Titanic-sized hoax, then I can't think of anyone better than the richest man alive. Correction, John Jacob Astor IV may have not been the richest man alive, exactly, that much is debated, but he was undeniably one of them, certainly the richest on Titanic. In 1912, Astor had a net worth of roughly $87 million. Think Thurston Howell III from Gilligan's Island, but on steroids. A guy like that was probably tipping the bill hop in $100 bills. And just think, for Molly Brown, the waitress, it all started in a Missouri restaurant when in through the door walked Mark Twain. At the time of their travels together, Astor was 47 years old, fresh off a divorce, and on his honeymoon with 18-year-old socialite Madeline Talmadge Force. Adding to the controversy, in case you didn't notice, was their 29-year age difference. We are told the couple took an extended honeymoon in Europe and Egypt to wait for the gossip to settle down 
But that's not the John Jacob Astor IV that I've come to know. You'll see what I mean in a page or two. I might as well get this out of the way now, though. His marriage to Madeline was likely all part of the act, and it wouldn't surprise me in the least if her parents were in on the intended drama. Refer to the front page spread of the New York Herald again, and you'll see that Madeline's portrait has taken top billing. Not a bad gig for Mrs. Astor, when you stop to think about it. Put in a few months' work and write out your remaining years as a millionaire bachelorette. Mr. and Mrs. Astor were busy cooking something up all right, and as you can plainly see, the unsinkable Molly accompanied them. But I haven't any reason as to believe why they honeymooned in the places where we're told they were. We are furthermore given no good reason whatsoever as to why Brown would hang with Astor on his honeymoon, and even less as to why all three hitched a ride onto Titanic together. Astor wanting his young bride, his correction, his young pregnant bride to have their baby in America is one thing. But then Molly's excuse, which involved a call to return to the United States because her son was sick or whatever, is way too convenient. If you stop to think about it, it is not Titanic where Molly Brown enters the world stage, but on Lifeboat 6, which is why I've given her the award for the greatest crisis actor possibly of all time. Name practically any other victim or survivor worth mentioning, and they all arrived with credentials, but not Molly. No, Molly made a name for herself on Lifeboat 6 when she threatened to throw Quartermaster Robert Hitchens overboard, or in the very least spank him with her paddle, for not picking up the floaters. Once again, the wiki tells us, Sources vary as to whether the boat went back and they found anyone alive. What do you mean by sources vary? Just ask Molly. Surely, she could tell us if she were sassy enough or not to return the ship to turn the ship around. By, by now, you should know exactly what they mean by varying sources. The entire narrative is swarming with crisis actors. All the writers of history can attempt to do is iron out the wrinkles. There's far too many. Fun fact, I found two other suffragettes listed in Molly's boat. Elsie Edith Bowerman and journalist author Helen Churchill Candy. She must be the other varied source. And then there's this. During the last years of her life, Brown was an actress. Are you getting this? Molly Brown was an actress. Of course she was an actress. She was so good at being a crisis actor that even the official narrative eventually went with it and named her an honorary one. The part where they tell us she became an actress during the last years of her life is simply how they throw it in our faces. That much is a lie. She was always an actress. You know who else was an actor? This guy was. John Jacob Astor IV. The writers of history don't even attempt to hide that fact. His greatest starring role was being the richest person on the Titanic who drowned. But here we see him dressed up as Henry IV of France. Among Astor's other accomplishments was A Journey in Other Worlds, an 1894 science fiction novel about life in the year 2000 on the planet Saturn and Jupiter. You're already familiar with Jules Verne. Well, I'm willing to bet that every turn-of-the-century science fiction novel or space opera was written by Freemasons. Astor even has his very own IMDb bio page where, <laughs> just in case you had any doubts, he's listed as an actor, playing himself but still acting. Films include such classics as President McKinley's inspection of Camp Wyckoff in 1898, Colonel John Jacob Astor, staff and veterans of the Spanish-American War in 1899, and Astor Battery on Parade. They're all wartime propaganda films. But not just any war. The Spanish-American War was the same imaginary conflict which William Randolph Hearst invented to sell newspapers. Even uh, historical writer t storytellers are admitting to that fact now. How they're not cult classics is anybody's best guess. But then, check out his immediate relations. His sister, Helen's husband, was diplomat James Roosevelt. Recognize the name? James was a half-brother of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Another one of Astor's sisters, Carrie, was a noted philanthropist and the wife of Marshall Orme Wilson. Dig a little deeper into Wilson, and we come to find that he was the brother of banker Richard Thornton Wilson Jr. and socialite Grace Wilson. Not seeing the next connection? Well, Grace married a Vanderbilt. Them again? Still think they had Astor murdered? 
These spooks are employed for the same people working towards the same agenda, and they're all related. We then we, we uh, read this in the Wikipedia. In the aftermath, and the aftermath, ships were sent out to retrieve the bodies from the side of the sinking. Of the 1,517 passengers and crew who perished in the sinking, only 333 bodies were ever recovered. Astor's his body was recovered on April 22nd by the cable ship Mackie Bennett. Astor was identified by the initials sewn on the label of his jacket pocket. Wait, hold on. Did the Wikipedia just tell us that only 333 bodies were ever recovered? I'm pretty sure that is what I just read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I reread it just to be certain. 333 bodies. Not 329 bodies. Not 342. Nope. 333. I'd say you can't make this stuff up, but that's precisely what they're doing. Making it up as they go along. Edit. I know I've already mentioned the 333 bodies, but only because I'm not writing this stuff in order. Only here did I discover it. It's still worth repeating, and really, they don't even think to bring up that number, except when speaking about Astor. How interesting. It's also Masonic. Here's the photo they give us to show documented evidence of all those bodies they were collecting, including Astor's. We are told they were exhausted. Exhausted, I tell you, from collecting all those bobbing bodies. 333 of them. Looks like tiresome work. They didn't give up either until Astor's body was finally recovered on the 22nd of April. How was he identified? They're kind enough to tell us. Astor was identified by the initials sewn on the label of his jacket. You've got to be kidding me. And if that isn't bad enough, as if to erase any doubts, we are told in the very next paragraph... Gracie claimed Astor's body was recovered in a crushed condition. That's what it says. Gracie, as you will recall, was his 18-year-old wife. However, two crew members on the Mackie Bennett, not to mention Captain Richard Roberts, a commander of Astor's personal yacht, said that Astor's body was pristine, aside from a little discoloration, that is. Even the mortician who prepared his body kept to the script, assuring everyone that the billionaire was undamaged. Wiki claims it was Gracie's story which led to the belief that Astor was killed by a falling smokestack. But I'm not so certain about that. Knowing the sheer number of crisis actors running around, planted among the press, any one of them might have invented the smokestack story. Meanwhile, you'd think Gracie would have a say on the matter, lowering him into the ground and all. Astor was buried on May 4th, 18 days after the drowning, in Trinity Cemetery of all places closed casket. Nobody saw the body. Trinity. How very Masonic of him. Look, either he was crushed or he wasn't. Who was wrong and who was right? It's not simply one person lying, though. There are so many lies. Far too many. I could go on picking them apart one by one, but I'm sad to say I'm all out of time. Just know there are hundreds, no, thousands of articles written on Titanic, not including the movie tie-ins and, I guess, book tie-ins and biography tie-ins, all of which take up the juggling act, but only to reel you into the emotion and the confusion. The Wikipedia has dozens of articles alone which aim to cover every possible loophole, hoping you don't notice. But I noticed. Hopefully, you did too. Okay, if that was it, guys, and I can't believe we had a technical difficulty where I was booted off the internet. That's like the second time. I know. I'm going to try to get back in here. Now, look, and I just finished, and it just popped up. Is this amazing or what? Am I in? I'm not in. I hear you. Okay, cool. Here I am. All right. Thank you guys for sticking with me. We always have some sort of tech issue. I never know what it's going to be. This time I was booted out. But um, what did you guys think of that? Thanks for the time warp. <laughs> yeah, overall, it just makes me think of how far back planning and execution of that planning was done through a the media, uh, the big support in the media and and people to orchestrate it, uh, actors, etc, to play these parts and 
and roles and then to put forth the story out there and just hammer it away. It's amazing. These crisis actors are legit. They're real. I have interviewed them. And without going into too many details, um, there was a, when Las Vegas happened, uh, the, the, the Las Vegas shooting, that was, what was that? It was like October 2017, I believe it was. And there was a very fa- uh, popular, you would all know this person's name. If I said it, I will not say it. Uh, um, but there was a very popular flat earthist with two social media friends who um, were, like, everybody is talking about Las Vegas. We're trying to figure out what happened. And there were two people there who claimed that they were there uh, during the shooting. And they were going back and forth with this flat earthist who appeared to know them. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. Uh, Something seemed very off about it. And so, just like in the scenario with um, Daniel taking the the two, uh, I guess they were like leaders of Israel, into separate rooms and interviewing about the woman, and um, in the book of Susanna, I took them aside separately. They didn't know I was interviewing the other, and I just started grilling them on what happened. Well, I noticed some um, something very odd, is that there was a photo. Uh, man, I wish I could find that photo now. There was a photo of a man that was floating all over the internet. And people were talking about this guy who was apparently shot. And there was a clock over, he's in the the hospital in a bed and he's recovering. There's a clock over him. That's like, it's like at a certain time that everyone was saying like, either the clock was broken or the picture was fake because it couldn't possibly have been that time when they said he was there. Well, these two people, they both, uh, claimed to know this person and the woman claimed that that was her boss and that they were a, um, a bartender and then the guy told me something completely else and I'm just and finally I like I called them out and I said this is BS you guys are making this up because I just talked to this other person who knew this guy and you know what they did boom split wouldn't talk to me again but this is what crisis actors do and they they they're 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 real people and they go into like social media, your Facebook account, they come all over and they start spreading these stories to keep it real and keep it emotional. And they never really think that you're going to put the pieces together and look at all the little fine details. And that's why it's just, it's almost, it's almost humorous now to look back at all these accounts of the Titanic and historians are like, uh, well, that's fake. That didn't happen. That, you know, we know, we know it really sank and these people were really there, but 90% of these stories are all you know, con, you know, made up in the press or by these people and, you know, what is real and what is not. Right. And so eventually you just get to the point you're like, yeah, that, it, it, it's so obviously the whole thing is a lie. I had a friend who uh, I grew up with, like literally went to elementary school with, and then like later connected through Facebook. And she was like, yeah, I live in Sandy hook. I, I never sent anything again. <laughs> It's like, I'm not even going to ask her. <laughs> oh, if, if she knew, like, anybody who was killed or anything like that? Yeah, or even if it was my friend I grew up with. <laughs> uh, I would just like the record to state that I have never sang the Titanic song in the shower. Yeah, I don't think I have. I don't think I have somebody either. Do somebody do the melody so I can... Banish it from my brain again. <laughs> I remember um, it was the summer of 1998, and I was flying over the Atlantic, and the on the map and the whereabouts, of course, where the Titanic would have sunk. And they showed this is back like I don't know what I don't even know what flights are like now, but you know international flights, I should say. But they were much nicer back then, before September 11th, and. They they showed Titanic of all films on this flight, and I'll never it, I'll never forget like it, like you know women are like you know, like all emotional. I can look around, I can see women crying because they you know the part at, at the end where Leonardo DiCaprio he like you know he lets go of her and he like sinks down you know, and as soon as he let go and he sunk, there were probably three or four guys in the back of the plane. They weren't in the same party. They were all not related. And they stood up and started cheering and applauding, and. <laughs> 
And, and like people were like mentally disturbed by this. Like women were upset. Like why would they? Why would they? Why would they cheer when he died? You know, but uh, <laughs> but it's just it's just it goes to show like you know these films they really like this indoctrination. It's all about reeling you into the emotion, into the personal stories, and you know like like how could you not believe this novel because somebody you know you know told this to the press you know like they wouldn't lie about something like that you know that kind of stuff that's right Noel. they wouldn't lie about any of it they're always telling the truth i have a question about the technology and maybe this just shows my ignorance about engineering but um <clears throat> do we know like i mean did they have it seems like this was an extraordinarily grand ship compared to everything else that had ever been created. <clears throat> I'm just curious if some of this uh, narrative could have been centered around, you know, covering up like Millennial Kingdom stuff. I don't know whether this was like built in that era. Or, you know what I'm saying? You mean you mean the ships themselves, like the White Star Line, the fleet, like the Olympics, the, the Olympic, the Titanic. There was the um, um, there was a ship I think called the Titan. The of course there was the Lusitania. You mean you're talking like those ships that they that they rolled them out at a certain time or what? Yeah, that, that's kind of my question. Like, did we actually have the technology I, to build these? At this point in time, I don't doubt it. It's it's almost like um, it's like a rebound. Like we see the earliest photos with the mud flood, we're like, you know, you know, I don't need to describe this to you guys. You know what I'm talking about? Like people like on their wagons with a horse and their boots in the mud, and they got a shovel or whatever, and you know, contrasted with these magnificent buildings, right? And so it went on long like that for we don't know how many decades, you know. And they kind of had to rebound. They had to get intel. They had to start indoctrinating people, burn stuff down, and but they really start kind of getting on their feet and 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 moving. And then of course by by the 1890s, 1900, like think of um, they started burning down these cities. They started burning down Chicago. They burned down San Francisco in what was like 1605 or 19, not 1605, like 1905 or right in the whereabouts. But they started building these cities up again with these huge buildings, right? These like steel structures, you know, the, the Chrysler building, the Empire State building, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's like they're rebounding and they're doing something very different, right? They're not building the same type of tech. It's a different, it's a different type of tech. Um, so I, I obviously couldn't answer that question that I, I don't know. I mean, is it a possibility that they hid these ships for 100 years? Sure, it's a possibility. There are so many different avenues of what actually happened to Titanic 2. This kind of goes along with what you brought up. Um, that I, I think that they actually rolled out Titanic just as another ship. Like, people were on and had, you know, they believed Titanic sank and they never would have questioned it. Um, it could have it could have been the It could have been the Lusitania. It could have been the Olympic. It could have been any of those. Um, I would like to look in the theory is if there was a Olympic and um, Titanic and they're just interchangeable, they're the same ship. Um, all that to say is you know, they could, they could, I guess, maybe hide some of this stuff. The Molly Brown story is really like in our faces, the way you brought out the crisis actors and how that was portrayed in the media and in film. Really, once again, it's just rubbing your nose in a false narrative, popularizing a fiction. Yep. Yeah, she got made into a musical. Oh, yeah. with... Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was no. You okay. Sound... <laughs> okay. Um, I was just going to say, I noticed part of the narrative you were talking about was around um, Lifeboat Seven, and it sort of it just reminded me of Building Seven, which was sort of the like <clears throat> I don't know the the outlier of nine eleven that tipped off a lot of people to the fact that it was a hoax. It kind of seemed like there was a lot of focus on this lifeboat seven as well. I, was, I don't know if that was some sort of like inside joke for their, you know, psyops or whatever. But did you see any connection there, or was that just a coincidence? Well, that is an interesting connection that I hadn't made. Um, it wasn't what I was thinking when I was looking at this. Now, keep in mind, as I had said earlier, that, guys, there is so much information on the Titanic. Like, so many articles out there. Even on Wik Wikipedia, like, covers, like, tries, they try to cover everything. That what I was able to cover there in those 70 something pages that I wrote this last week, if I, like I said earlier, if I was given another week and another week and another week, I could have just keep adding to this and make it a not like three, 400 page, you know, book. Um, 
that's how much just how ridiculous it gets. And I, I specifically looked at Lifeboat Seven. There's there's something very there's something very interesting about Lifeboat Seven. It was the first to go down and uh, go out. You know, it was only half filled. That included a guy dressing like a woman and uh, somebody's dog, I guess. But you know, some very interesting intel people like the Pillsbury family and others. I I I I would I would have to look more at you know why some boats were more important than others. Um, you know, some some boats seem to have kind of nobody of importance and others had very important people on it but um you know what it didn't cool it wasn't an iceberg it was captain nimoy nemo <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that, you know it's funny it's funny because like you know, they all had the saying, you know, it, like it's the, the saying for the movie, you know, even, you know, God couldn't sink this ship or whatever. But the thing is, it's, 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 it's a very similar narrative. It really is to September 11th, where, you know, we're told that these two airliners, you know, and the, the, the fuel melted the, the steel beams and, you know, caused the buildings to collapse in their own pancake, right? Like, you know, even, you know, even God couldn't collapse these buildings, right? And then they collapse, you know, in a demolition. And the thing is, is that the Titanic, should have just steamrolled right through that iceberg. It really should have. Like the only, ex it's kind of like remember all the um, all those stories we heard about the twin towers. How they said it was designed. We saw the picture with the um, the airplane that that crashed into the uh, the Empire State Building, and it like it, it it took out like a couple floors, and there was, was like big gaping hole. Then they were able to repair it and fix it. No big deal. It's the same thing. You know, they talked how the like a like a screen door that even if you were to puncture it that it would still they would still have its frame it would still stand all that kind of stuff and it's the same thing with titanic like at worst it should have it should have like maybe kind of crashed into it got a hole whatever kind of like kind of float a little bit you know wonky and then get towed in but it's it's you know that's why it, it's almost laughable now when we have to look at how they like invented that they they literally invented the whole story how it just got like like the steel just got lopped in half it's just and just like you know it fell and that's the only way they were trying to explain it because you know i don't know if it's physics or what like you know engineers would have looked at this and go like that ship should not have sunk so that's why they just had to make up the whole story about how it just got you know sliced but you know the reason you know, you know what I, again go ahead dave <laughs> sorry my headphones have like a delay so i keep cutting you off um i was just gonna say it is kind of interesting um thinking back to the film that they made obviously it seems like james cameron gets all the big hoaxes i guess but um they actually fit a lot of the hoax narrative in that you had gone over in your article today. Um, but just kind of like, you know, stuff, you know, put some of it on other characters and things like that. But even like the weird part about the guy, like jumping into the lifeboat with the child, you know, like that's what uh, Billy Zane's character did. He like jumped into the lifeboat with the child. Well, I don't know. I think, I, I think it was, I, I think, it, it. I think it was Billy Zane who they had dressed like the woman. If I recall, right, I think he dressed like a woman to get on the boat. Yeah, he, had a right. he had a child. He had a He he did both. He dressed as a woman, and he had somebody's child, which he like handed off to somebody once he got on the boat or whatever. Yeah, no, James Cameron is like so obviously just like the movies he pushes out. There's no possible way that that's just all coincidental. You know, his whole catalog i'd have to look at true lies again if there's like any kind of predictive programming in that you know that came out before 9 11 but like all his other films are just there's just no way yeah, i wanted to ask uh this this millionaire which would be a billionaire for our time uh that supposedly died on there john jacob astor the fourth yeah yeah thank you uh I would presume that, per, did you find anything where he may have been tied in with it in a financial way, gain, you know, ga gaining financially or any, anything, anything to that nature or just tied in 
through his uh, lineage or that that type of stuff. Um, I so <clears throat> one of the big conspiracies out there, uh, which I do not subscribe to, is that see a lot of what a lot of conspiracy theorists do is that they 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 get it right that they look that there's something very wrong with the world and that you know there's eat this evil elite and so on and so forth. But then they play with the narrative. They actually will take the narrative that they're fed and they're they'll go with it. And that's always a big mistake. It's almost like, you know, believing that two airliners actually hit the World Trade Center, if that makes any sense. When in fact, you know, I I, I say that there weren't even any airliners that hit it. Like it was all it was all faked. So that what one of the big things is that in which I talked about in here is that J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds were starting the Federal Reserve, which um, I, I want to. I, I read it often here. What was it? When was that put into law? It was. Um, mm, I could find this here real quick. Yeah, it was like uh, nineteen fifteen or something. Um, December twenty third, nineteen thirteen. So almost two years later. Uh, which again, that's today's date, December twenty third. Really creepy. But <clears throat> so a lot of people will say that that. The Morgan and the the Vanderbilts and no, it was mainly Morgan and the Rothschilds had to off some people to, in order to get the Federal Reserve uh, made. And they will say that uh, John Jacob um, Astor the Fourth was one of them, as well as um, Isidore Strauss, which I don't see any connection there, and Benjamin Guggenheim. Again, I I don't see any connection there. But the the, the theory is that they were opposed to the Federal Reserve, even though, again, I can't see anything on record that they ever were. So that's one of the ideas that you know J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds somehow coaxed them onto the Titanic. And proof of this is that the Vanderbilts kind of got wind of it and backed out at the last minute. And then, you know, they, they, these rich people died, even though that, see, it's just going with the narrative. It's just ridiculous because it's like, like, even if, I mean, the way the world would really work is that like the very wealthiest, like they would make sure that he was given a life raft. Like they would, he would be the first one to get, you know, pampered and get the, the life raft. Like that's just the way the world works. Like that, that would be a terrible plan if J.P. Morgan took down the Titanic just to have these three guys died who apparently qu conveniently died. Um, but yeah, I can't see any, <clears throat> um, I have yet to see any kind of financial investments or reasons other than the fact that, like I said, this, this was not, they, if they didn't sink the Titanic, it was not an expensive, um, psyop. It was just, you know, paying off the crisis actors, it, however much they get paid, I have no clue. I've, I, I've seen the ads in the paper. I've never called them up to, you know, <laughs> to take a job and, you know, <laughs> and apply and see how much you get paid for something like that. But I imagine it's not much, but people will do a lot for, you know, just to be in the papers. Um, <clears throat> yeah, hopefully that answered your question. I, I don't know. That's fine. What what I what I see obviously what we see with all these guys though like J.P. Morgan and stuff I mean I brought up the fact that the the Vanderbilts the the uh, Morgan they made their their fortunes off railroads and it's really interesting if we consider the fact that the railroads were already there and so they're they're capitalizing off something that it's claimed to being built that they you know restructured and so on and so forth made all tons of money became trillionaires really i mean i don't even know what they would be today they would be you know stinking filthy rich and you know and you got morgan who is bringing in nikola tesla and edison he's sponsoring both these guys you know and he he so he's showing you uh, what he's not, what you're not going to have, which is like the Tesla coil and that kind of stuff. And then he's bringing in Edison. He's enslaving everybody. He's enslaving everybody with the, um, with the Federal Reserve. And that you know, the, he's the whole point of the Titanic is a psychodrama, right? It's it's to further enslave people to the the spell, the magic, the you know, this is what they do over and over and over again with these hoaxes. So that that's the only kind of. Uh, that's the only motive that I can really see. Just 
constantly pulling the wool over people's eyes. You know, uh, hoax after hoax after hoax after hoax. Yeah, hoax and fear, hoax and fear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of a psychodrama, right? It's, it's, the, it's the, to cause people to think about living the experience and surviving it and getting caught up in the emotions of these stories. And that's one of the hard things when you're talking about things like this and, uh, you know, the, the capital H word is that people really get caught up in the emotions of it. And they just, you know, they just, they, they're like, how dare you? You know, these people, they, they, they have this traumatic experience and you don't believe them. And, you know, it, because it just, people get, it, the, the emotions are strong on this kind of stuff. A question, Noel. Yeah. Did, in your research on this, did you find any evidence of fundraising for the poor victims and such? You yes. Know, of the, because that seems to be one of the big things that goes, they make a lot of money off these psyops also because the first thing they do is organize fundraising and everybody donates to, you know, multiple, every disaster, every time there's a shooting, every time there's any kind of hoax, you know, there's a slew of fundraising that pops up. Yeah. They got, they got that angle covered also. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Rebecca. Thank you. And, and I, man, I, I, I there were so many angles I should have covered, and this is one of them because Molly Brown, she was obviously fundraising for that uh, that church in uh, that cathedral in Denver, which actually John Levy actually covered that building too, which is really interesting. Um, clearly mud flood, clearly rolled out. Like you, I guess you can't roll out a building like you can a ship, but um, you know it, they said that it was built and finished in 1911, and she fundraised that well. The first thing Molly Brown was doing, she was hitting up the fundraisers and making a name for herself, going around and for the the raising funds for all the the poor third class survivors. Well, this is how you this is how you um, sell the narrative to the masses. This is one of the ways to keep um, this story in people's minds um, because you know they didn't necessarily had the TV they. So this is the way you reach the masses. This is one of the ways. Is wow. You when we look back, it's like you were saying, and in, in, in your paper on the um, Spanish flu, which was you know turn of the century, um, beginning of the last century too, to just show you, like, um, and you see the photos of it. It's like wow. It was completely controlled back then and it was like it like again all the world's a stage yeah and <clears throat> so you mentioned that there's no television right so which is true so you don't have the public consciousness all like you know tuning you into cnn fox news whatever at the same time and it, i it's so interesting how you look at all these newspapers that you know you have like the the new york papers that on april 15th for that edition of that day they already had like the you know the full page you know spread it's kind of like for those of you who've seen it when there's like a shooting or something like that and all of a sudden you know you you go look on google and stuff and you see the um the stories that were published on the day before like their accidents but they actually had them ready to publish and you're like oh you know like that but then you have these newspapers divided down the middle where you you literally have uh, they're they're telling you that they all made it safely and it's just not one or two it's many different papers and they're they're telling you this and so th the country is sectionalized right if you're in baltimore if you're in baltimore you're reading about how the people survived if you're just uh north of there in new york city you're reading about how they died Right, and if you're over, like in, I think it was in Michigan. This is probably have, part of the psyop. It, know, it great is great point because this is this is really important point that we go. Why would they do that on purpose? That they're telling two different stories and not letting the people know about it. Where it's like you got people thinking that wherever, whatever story, and they're like, no, we heard it this way, and somebody else heard it. No, we heard it this way, and then. You know, one day along, they these two meet, and we have this just um, conflict of 
how history unfolded. But what's what's more at work there is like, no, this has been going on a long time, not just a falsification of history, but telling different false stories of history, p- p- passing different lies. Like um, who kn- we? It's like somebody in California gets this story, someone on the East Coast gets a different story. Yeah, and they're doing it on purpose. Yep. Yep. And that purpose is evil intentions. I was kind of just touching on it a little bit, but I don't want to go too deep into the psychology or the psychiatry, but the, the psyop, but there's a psyop again behind why you're telling false narratives and telling two different false narratives. Again, it's kind of like um, they'll tell three or four. This is the de- this is Hasatan and spreading the lies. So you cannot tell what was truth from fiction. So to have multiple different stories is part of the deception because the whole thing was a false thing to begin with. So that's why it's good to have multiple or tell tell the truth at the same time as telling a false. So, you know, this is part of the, um, the mind control. It's really when, as you said, look, as we look back in history, it was playing out then. We can see it. Bring it to today, people. If they were if they were doing it that um, clearly back then, as we look, we see now today how interwoven it, it really has become in everyday life. As you were bringing up the Truman Show the other day to go, yeah, it's very Truman Show X this reality we live in. Yeah. And I, of course, you know, if some of you guys know, I, I brought up the Truman show. It was kind of fresh on my mind because last, um, last, what was it? I guess last Sunday. So we, 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 they cut the connection from our true history and then now they can tell you whatever, you know, uh, people, what they know about history again is what they what they've seen at the mo- what they've seen in the movies what they've seen on TV. Remember, they used to do that. You used to go to the movies to get the 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 history reel of them. They used to do the propaganda films at the movie theaters, um, and it's it's been propaganda the whole time. And it's what well, we see in the narrative fall apart. But for those who don't necessarily see through it. You're almost, you're in the land of make-believe, literally. They could tell them whatever and they would they would buy it because they've lost that connection to the truth. And that's where we go, look, we don't need to find what was the truth in history because Yahushua is our truth. That's why we can see this stuff with, you know, some clarity and some wisdom. Touching on what Mike just said um, regarding, you know, how you'll never really figure out. I'm more interested in breaking down the whole purpose and all the different aspects of the PSYOP. Not not any particular one, but like just their, their MO, their modus operandi. You know, um, one thing I know is there's the fundraising aspect. There's the ritual, you know, feeding on suffering and horror, black magic, whatever you want to call it, part of it. Um, There's also the, you know, feeding two different stories to promote cognitive dissonance, you know, and divide the population. Um, I I think it would be interesting to, to study the how and the why of the PSYOP as opposed to individual. I mean, we know that there's many, many, and we can, you know, list tons of them. But why don't we start breaking down the how and the why of the actual, you know, what they're doing? Well, my, okay, so for me, it, it, I, I could repeat this. The reason I, I repeat the word psychodrama 
is bit, and I, I think that that goes over people's head or in one ear out the out the other a lot. But there's a lot of sophistication to what a psychodrama is. Okay, and um, per, um, psychodrama or performance witchcraft goes all the way back to ancient Babylon. And in fact, um, so for anyone who's heard me say this before. I apologize, but it's almost something that needs to be said like in every single video or every single thing I write. I don't do it to be because I don't want to be repetitive, but it it this is kind of my world view of how I perceive the so-called reality behind around us. In ancient Babylon, they invented acting and acting um, uh, from a from a stage. And acting itself was uh, it was how the actors would work as basically these shamans that would basically knock on the door and get the the gods, the Elohim, to to open it up. They were, you know, they were the the person who revealed the other side of the curtain. But what was happening was is is that the reason why these performance witchcraft it has to be faked, right? It they have to fake this stuff over and over and over and over again is because it is in the the giving in when you're sitting in the audience and you're giving your um, and you're accepting this performance when you're giving your okay to it, um, you are. That's where the that's where the magic does its trick, and that's where the spell is cast. You know, and as they're causing you to feel emotion, joy, happiness, sorrow, tears, uh, fear, whatever you know, and you're leaving the theater. That that is the magic doing its 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 work. And so that's why I've said that I believe when the alien invasion happens, it's going to be faked. It's not. I, I mean, it's probably not going to be real aliens. Like we're going to be able to sit there and watch the aliens on TV and go, "That's fake. That's not real." Keep in mind that the aliens are already here, right? They're they're already running the world behind the scenes and. From, you know, guys like, you know, Zuckerberg's probably not even human, right? We all kind of joke about it, but we kind of know it's true that he's like, he's trying to figure out how to act human. It's really creepy. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's really what it comes down to over and over again. The reason why they do this time and time and time and time again, because it is performance, uh, witchcraft, or psychodrama is real magic. And one of the ways I've tried to make this uh, very um, practical is in something that's popular like Walt Disney World. Because everyone has probably been to Walt Disney World and they could visualize this. And so Walt Disney World is structured around little mini psychodramas. You know, you, you go on the Indiana Jones ride and you, you nearly escape death and it's thrilling and you make it through to the other end. Or, you know, you go on to, uh, into the Haunted Mansion or Pirates of the Caribbean or, or whatever. And as you go on each of these and you are cast into a role where you have to survive it, when that happens, they are then able to indoctrinate you, feed you information, change your psyche. Uh, program you in any number of ways. It's actually very, um, it, it, it's shocking how how well it, the tactic actually works. But that is, you know, that is what I call real magic. Um, and that's why we see these 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 hoaxes over and over and over again, and why they have to be hoaxes. Now, I do believe that they really do have real blood sacrifices. They really kill people, that kind of stuff. But um, I, I'm sure really. Real people really did die on September 11th, but I don't believe any one of those airliners died. Um, I believe half of the people who died weren't even real people. You see what I'm saying? It just it, It's just they keep hoaxing you over and over and over again and, and making you believe something happened and you give your your acceptance to that and let the, the magic kind of flow into you and do its work. So because we don't have pagan temples anymore, to, to other than, you know, maybe churches, to go into for them to do their performance ritual witchcraft, they just now carry it out over the television for all to see. So literally, they've just moved it out of the pagan temples into the world at large. That's basically what you're saying, right? Yeah, sort of. You know, in it's either in like uh, Second Kings or I think it's in First or Second Kings. It actually says of Jezebel that she ruled her kingdom by magic. It actually says that. 
I find that really interesting. And I always wonder, I used to wonder, like, what would that magic be that she would rule it by? Well, I, we know, we know how they did it. We know how the Egyptians did it. We know how the, um, the, the, uh, the Babylonians did it. They did it through psychodramatic exercises. She probably had, Jezebel probably had a very sophisticated, uh, like type of media network that she would put things into the news that people thought were real and weren't. That's, that's how they've always done it. And, you know, that's one of the things when we deal with history, too, that's really hard for people to get by, uh, get past. If we know how fake the news is, then imagine how fake history is, right? right because the... Yeah, go on, please. Well, it's it, one of the things people tell me all the time. This is one of the things I like going back and, and showing this stuff, like, you know, like, you know, the hoaxes that happened in the 1800s, because people tell me all the time, they're like, you know, when you come to the truth and you're like, okay, they faked the moon landing and then they, you know, they faked a couple other things like Columbine or whatever, whatever, whatever your, your conspiracy is. Uh, but they didn't used to do that. That's something new they're doing just now. And people, even conspiracy, there is, you don't get through to them that no, like this has been going on for a very, very, very long time. And even how the official narrative is set up, even if it's all fake and lies. I could I could take you through, and they even like Intel only knows how to write things one way. And you could take people to the the Friday the Thirteenth episode when all the the Knights Templar disappeared or were arrested in one night, and you're just like, that is so fake. That whole story is so fake. It never happened. And this stuff, how they've been, you know, telling these stories all through history. They're all they're you can see how they invent them, um, you know, to get a certain reaction from people, and so on and so forth.